Bruce's castle and cave on Ratlin Island is full of countless ghost stories and legends from local fishermen, hikers, and tourists. The island was a known sanctuary and hiding place for centuries until Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Norrie overtook the island and castle. Those living on the island quickly surrendered, but Norrie's forces slaughtered the helpless 400 civilians and 200 castle defenders, including the sick, old, and young. Today, the castle is in ruins. People have reported hearing screams and cries coming from the old site. A ghostly figure of a man in old leather armor is often seen guarding the castle perimeter before he vanishes. One spirit attempts to interact with people. She is the brown lady and walks the castle grounds and approaches visitors as if she is trying to speak, but she never says anything before fading away. The cave on Ratlin Island is believed to be the most haunted place in Northern Ireland. It is thought to have been bewitched long ago by the pagans who first inhabited the island. People report hearing moans and whispers coming from deep within the cave. Legend says that the Scottish King Robert the Bruce and his men hid in the cave from the English after a brutal defeat, waiting for their forces to regroup during the First War of Scottish Independence. Robert the Bruce eventually defeated the English and was recognized as the true King of Scotland. According to local folklore, the King never died, but he and his men returned to the old cave and entered into an enchanted sleep, waiting until the day they will awake and unite the people of Scotland to defend against those who attack it. Recently, a group of fishermen settled into the cave to take a break and to make tea. As they gathered and poured their cups, a hand appeared out of the darkness and placed an extra cup out to be filled. The fishermen quickly poured their mysterious guest a cup, but were too afraid to look up and see what was lurking in the darkness. The hand disappeared back into the depths of the cave with its cup. Fairies regularly travel from Ratland Island to Ballycastle, where you will find another old haunted castle overlooking the sea which has been turned into a hotel. Ballygally Castle is over 400 years old and is haunted by three very active spirits. The most well-known is Lady Isabella Shaw, the wife of Lord James Shaw, that only wanted a son so that he would have a proper heir. When Lady Shaw finally gave birth to a son, Lord Shaw took the baby from her and locked his wife in a tiny room at the top of the castle. One report says Isabella grew restless and possibly went insane in the room. She finally tried to escape, only to fall to her death. Others said that Lord Shaw, or someone he hired, threw Isabella out of the window at the top of the castle. Now, Isabella roams the castle in search of her baby. Guests hear strange noises, witness a mysterious green mist, and sometimes smell the old vanilla scent the lady was known to wear. She is most often seen in the tiny old room she was imprisoned in. Today, it has been fittingly named the Ghost Room, which guests can stay in if they so choose. Madame Nixon lived in the hotel during the 19th century and is thought to be the second ghost that roams the castle at night. Guests often report mysterious footsteps and glimpses of a phantom woman wearing a silk dress roaming the halls. The sound of a child running around, playing and laughing is often heard around the castle grounds, even when no guests have children with them. The restless child is known to play pranks on guests and staff. He loves to knock things over, unfold sheets and towels, so that unsuspecting staff will open locked rooms only to mysteriously find them in disarray. Apparently, a medium stayed at Ballygally Castle, and one night she detected, quote, more spirits than there were guests staying in the hotel.
The Preston Castle, standing tall and alone in the plains of California, was originally constructed in the 1800s as a prison boarding school for troubled young boys. Now that the school has been closed, it serves as a historical and haunted location that offers walking tours of the castle. For my 16th birthday, instead of throwing some big sweet 16 party like most people would, I decided to take a friend of mine to Northern California where we would explore as many haunted locations as possible and try to find evidence of ghosts. The Preston Castle was one such place we explored. My mom, my aunt, my best friend, for who the sake of anonymity will be called T, and I packed up our things and traveled north, arriving at the Preston Castle around 10 a.m. We entered the castle and decided to do the self-guided tour, which permitted us access to the first floor, the second floor, and the basement. The first floor was the least interesting of the three. When we entered the second floor, things started to get interesting. We came across a room filled with several children's toys, things like dolls, coloring supplies, and teddy bears. Using the EMF detector that I bought for the trip, I walked around the room to see if there were any changes in the electromagnetic field and came up with nothing. Then, when I was not moving, the meter spiked up to 12 when there was nothing in that same spot a moment before. I called my aunt over and showed her the reading while my mom and T moved on to the next room. While we stood there looking at the EMF, we noticed one of the crayons on the table begin to move on its own, despite the two of us being the only ones in the room. We both decided we should catch up to my mom and T. In the next room, we found T recording what she saw, a simple bedroom with a closet. Upon reviewing the recording later, we found a class three apparition. In the video, you can see a pale white arm sticking out of the closet that none of us could see when we were there in person. The rest of the second floor was pretty bland, aside from a few unexplainable spikes on the EMF meter. Unfortunately, she looked on her Snapchat later to see if she still had it, but today she doesn't have it saved to her memories and can't seem to find the footage. Finally, we arrived at the basement which was by far the scariest floor we were allowed in. The third and fourth floors were off limits to the public as the flooring was unsafe to walk on. We were walking through and we reached a room referred to as the chemical pool and it is exactly what it sounds like. Back when this was a boarding school, the boys that came to the school often had head lice or scabies. The solution the workers at Preston Castle came up with was to fill a pool with chemicals that could kill the lice and throw the boys in, forcing them to swim across. Several boys drowned or received injuries from the chemicals because of this. As we were looking upon the emptied chemical pool, I walked away from my group for a moment to scan the room with EMF. I was close to the corner of the room when the EMF spiked to 15 and I suddenly felt a hand tightly grip my thigh I whipped around, expecting to see somebody from my group standing behind me. Perhaps they were trying to prank me, and we would laugh about it afterwards. But when I turned, there was no one there. My aunt called across the room, asking me what was wrong. I glanced down at my leg and saw a small white handprint on my thigh where I was grabbed. I explained to my group what had happened, but no one seemed to believe me until we were walking to the next room where my aunt suddenly jumped and spun around to look at us. She asked which of us had touched her neck, but none of us had. The final room we explored in the Preston Castle was the entrance room. It was here the boys would have to sign in back when the castle was still in use. Stepping into this room, it was easy to feel the immense temperature drop. The castle had no power Therefore, there was no reason that room should have been colder than any of the others. This put us on edge immediately. So, naturally, I turned on the EMF. 
it was going crazy in there, giving us the highest reading that we'd gotten so far, which was 25. Obviously, we were freaking out about this, but we still wanted to explore more. Eventually, we decided that we weren't going to stay in there any longer. I was walking behind the rest of my group when an unexplainable, strong force pushed me into T. That weekend was by far the scariest and most amazing birthday I have ever had. I have plenty of tales from that weekend, as well as other ghostly experiences that were not from that birthday. But those stories are for another time. From 2013 to 2019, I worked in outdoor education at many different summer camps and outdoor education centers in Canada, mostly Ontario, but I did spend a season in the Rocky Mountains. Having grown up going to sleepaway camp and eventually participating in month-long leadership programs with backcountry canoeing components, I was well prepared to lead a group of teen girls from a camp in Georgian Bay on a two-week camping trip in the Temagami region during my first year as a counselor. The Temagami region is located between North Bay, Sudbury, and Timmins, Ontario. This region is home to many provincial parks, wonderful hiking and canoeing routes, and the Bear Island Indian Reserve. Our route was fairly typical and beginning in the Whitefish Falls region, ending at Highway 11 after 14 days of paddling portaging, hiking, and campfire making. We had a satellite phone to check in with our camp director every day, and in case of emergency. We also had multiple exit points along the route. Until our second to last night, we were having fun and a relatively uneventful time, other than some mild dehydration and the usual bumps and bruises. Near the end of our trip, we were doing some free camping on the shore of an uninhabited island in Bear Lake which is recognized as part of the Bear Island Indian Reserve. It's a beautiful area, and we were across from the main island that the majority of the 250-person population inhabits. We had put out the fire and gone to bed, when about an hour after falling asleep, I was jarred awake by the sound of a loud motorboat. Obviously, this isn't that weird, because it's a large lake, and many people use boats to reach the mainland or their homes on secluded islands. However, it was around 11 p.m., and things had been quiet for the last few hours. The motor cut out, and I could clearly hear the sounds of an argument. It sounded like at least one man and a woman, and they were very angry and yelling at each other, although I couldn't hear anything specific because they were too far offshore. Suddenly, the woman screamed, and I heard a splash in the water, and then total silence. At this point, I was pretty freaked out and hoping to God that my girls hadn't woken up. But I wasn't that lucky because I could immediately hear talking from their tent and I could tell that they were scared. I was about to unzip my door and look out to see if maybe the boaters had had an accident or something when the whole tent lit up. The light slowly panned across me and onto the tent my girls were in, which immediately made them quiet. In a normal volume, I was able to tell them to stay absolutely still. The light panned back onto my tent and then over to theirs again. I can only guess that it must have been some sort of boat with a searchlight on it. After an eternity that was really only about five minutes, the light was turned off and I heard the motor engage and fade as the boat went away from us. I immediately found the satellite phone and called our camp director, who gave us the phone number for the local police. I called them and they said that they would forward the information that I had given to the local native detachment on Bear Island. I don't think any of us slept that night, and I got up at 5 a.m. to take my canoe out and take a look around. I thought maybe somebody had fallen overboard and had managed to swim ashore. Obviously, I didn't find anyone, and there was nothing floating in the water either, although it is a pretty deep body of water. 
None of us wanted to camp one more night, so I called the camp and had them head out to the pickup point a day early. We paddled like hell and didn't really talk much. I think that none of us wanted to speculate about what we might have heard and what might have happened if we had made a noise or moved when that light was on our tents. I've thought about this a lot over the years, but whenever I've told people the story, they've been quite skeptical. I recently started looking into missing person cases in the area, but without much luck. Regardless of what we heard, something bad happened that night. And I'm just glad that nothing bad happened to us. We were going camping in western Washington. It was late, and we weren't going to make it to our usual campsite. So my uncle mentioned that he knew about a lake not far off the freeway. My uncle had a box truck, and we were all going to sleep in it. There were six kids and my uncle and father. My dad was driving an old Bronco with some of us with him. When we found the lake and parked, us kids went to bed in the box truck, because it was close to midnight. My dad and uncle started a campfire and were just BSing. I couldn't sleep, so I was chilling in my sleeping bag listening to them. All of a sudden, we started hearing wild noises, like chanting, and then these sounds that just made the hair on my neck stand straight up. I immediately thought Bigfoot. My dad and uncle freaked out, and my dad got his pistol out. They waited another 10 minutes, and the sounds got louder. Then they got everybody up and packed us all up, and we left in a hurry. I have never seen them that scared. We were all scared. I have no idea what the location was now. I was nine years old, and this was back in the 80s. But that experience never left me. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in the truck. I get to this trail early in the morning and I hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot. I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance beneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, mostly like a deer, with a lame leg because it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. I think nothing else about it after that and I go on eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep. So I pull out a book that I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point, and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted, with dragging noises following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing, and stops. I hear nothing. No breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing, Nothing but trees and darkness. 
What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and I sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and just tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing, or if it's just the product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions. All different. Old men, old women, younger adults, even children. And I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in. So I grab my rifle, preparing to fire off a warning shot into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed something. The nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a single shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intently to my surroundings. No laughing, and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I had scared whoever was there off, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grabbed my rifle and tried to listen to what they were saying. I couldn't make out much, but I heard something about being lost. So I shouted, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again, are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anybody following me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night, and I've never done it since. A few months ago, three other friends and I went out to camp near a lake. We went camping on the shore of the lake, right next to a forest that went up a hill. It was nighttime and the sky was very clear. We had a fire going and so one friend and I decided to go a bit farther near to the lake to look at the stars. You could see the Milky Way and everything. It was really cool. While we were there, we were talking a little bit, and I noticed a light in the forest, above where the other two friends were, and above where we were camping. It was really bright in the middle, like a white orb, and at first I thought it was a person with a flashlight. The next thing I know, it zipped in a straight line, super fast, then went back again, with the same speed. Then, instantly, it just disappeared. My other friend who was with me saw it, and we both got really freaked out. He is very religious and can't explain it to me, but still doesn't want to believe that it's anything paranormal. So I'm kind of alone in this. The other friends didn't see anything because it was behind them. I have no idea what it could have been. The weird thing was that it was at the moment we noticed it 
that it reacted and moved around and disappeared. I wonder if it had been there the whole time while we were camping. There would have been no way to see it. Only when we moved away and then faced toward our camp could we have seen it. I told my other friends about it and they thought I was just joking. And the friend who was with me and saw it doesn't want to talk about it. So I don't really have any good answers. For the rest of the camping trip, I felt really uneasy. Given that this happened in the middle of the woods at night in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the fact that I was a child when it happened, I understand that this could be almost anything. However, even at 23, recalling this moment still brings tears to my eyes and cold chills down my back. I was about 10 years old and it had to have been around 11 p.m. I was at a horse camp in Battleground, Washington and I was the only person awake in my cabin. I heard this sound far off in the distance. It sounded like a horse whinnying, which makes sense. Only it didn't stop. It was one long whinny that kept going. After about six to seven seconds, the pitch grew lower and lower until it turned into this god awful low guttural scream. It went on for probably about 30 seconds with no pause. I know 30 seconds seems short, but when you're sitting there as a child with nothing between you and it but a screen door, it feels like ages. I never heard that sound again after that, and I know it's a very short story, but even now when I tell this story, it brings tears to my eyes. Other than Bigfoot, because I'm sure it's not that, is there any folklore pertaining to the Pacific Northwest that could account for this sound? I don't know of anything that starts out as a horse whinny, never stops, and ends up in a demonic growling scream. I would love to know what it was that I experienced. Maybe I won't be so afraid of it anymore. I've never really had any paranormal experiences before, but I cannot explain this. I'm in college and about seven other people and I from my school went on a backpacking trip. We had two experienced leaders. We drove to Zaleski State Forest, which is in the Appalachian region of Ohio. It was early April this year and it was cold. Everything was still dead from winter. After hiking miles into the forest, we set up camp at the backpacking campsite. There were a couple of other groups of people as well. A few of them were friendly older couples and then two college-aged girls. Everyone was pretty spread out from each other. We set up camp farther away from everyone else. I've always been able to sense energies of places and the energy in this place wasn't great. It was almost spooky. Each of us had individual one-person tents, and we formed a kind of cluster in this site, with my tent being in the back, so no one was behind me. Our cluster was also right next to the forest, because this backpacking site was like a big cleared off square in the middle of the trees. Fast forward, I'm dead asleep around 2 a.m., and I wake up to leaves crunching right by my tent. I hear footsteps, walking in circles around my tent. They had a sort of heaviness to them that couldn't be a deer or a dog. Also, it sounded like it was bipedal. I could not make this up. This creature or thing was circling my tent for a long period of time, slowly creeping up to the sides of the tent and then just stopping for periods of time that seemed like forever. Then it would move on, walking around the rest of our tent cluster. 
I could hear a human-like breathing from the mouth whenever it was close to my tent, like a sort of light heaving. I was shaking, too scared to unzip my tent and investigate. I kid you not, this went on for hours, and it seemed to me like I was the only one awake. Out of nowhere, I see an illuminated light shape from my tent, although I couldn't tell what it was from inside my tent because it was all zipped up. It was like a warm glow, and it didn't move, kind of like a flashlight would if you were holding it still. I was paralyzed in fear. I simply couldn't believe that it was an animal. At some point, probably due to sheer exhaustion, I fell asleep, but I could hear the heavy footsteps circling right up until the point that I did. In the morning, I questioned my fellow campers about it, and my leader admitted that she had heard the footsteps and the noises as well, admitting that it was bizarre and that she would have investigated had she not been so groggy. One of the boys in the group said that he also noticed the light that came on, but thought that it was someone else. Not a single person in the group had gotten up to go to the bathroom or turned on a light that night. I've heard things about the Appalachian region being creepy and bizarre, and now I believe it. Some people on Reddit have leaned toward Bigfoot because apparently he's associated with light orbs. I've never really been a Bigfoot believer but I'm telling you, this didn't feel like just any animal or person or anything I've ever experienced before. So maybe Bigfoot is as good an explanation as any. For my lady's birthday, I took her to Gatlinburg, a popular, touristy, one main boardwalk town in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. We camped the first night, a few miles out in the woods at a popular location, Elkmet Campground. The campground was beautiful, tall green trees like baby redwoods, a clear water river scattered by checkered rocks, families with little ones running around, it was great. Through borrowing a tent, we found that we had no steaks and headed into town for supplies, whiskey, and hot dogs. It was dusk by the time we made it back to the campground. Most campers were surrounding their dissipating fires or cleaning up before the quickly coming night. Our tent was still up, but crunched up a little without the steaks allowing it to spread open as widely as it could. We fixed our tent and started a fire. As our night progressed, we found ourselves surrounding our campfire two to three hours later around midnight. Now, this was the sort of campground where another campsite is just 30 yards from yours. Bears frequent the area, and my girlfriend was already freaking out a little bit, which is why I booked our site in the dead center of the whole campground. All the other campers had gone to bed at this point, and the only sound we could hear was the slowly crackling fire and the light stream of the river flowing into the rocks. The clouds were covering a crescent moon, so there wasn't much light to begin with. We had flashlights and I would occasionally shine the light around us while avoiding hitting the other campers to confirm that we were fine and that there were no bears. Seemingly out of nowhere, from the campsite behind my girlfriend and to my left, a light shined directly on us and then all around in a frantic yet focused manner, kind of like the Eye of Sauron. I saw what appeared to be a man with the strangest gait I've ever seen. He wore a headlight and was focused on his picnic table. The man's gait seemed to me to be a little bit like Jar Jar Binks, just not normal. I could see through my periphery that the man focused his light on the picnic table, and whenever I turned my head toward him, immediately his light would hit my girlfriend and I. I could only see the outline of the man through the light of his headlight and the occasional flash of my light at his campsite once he continued to flash his light at ours in a very disconcerting way. This was the campsite across from us, where we saw no one at all the night prior. I could only see the outline of his body as all black, as if he was in an all black bodysuit. His movements were eerily repetitious. 
For what went on to close to an hour, this man would shine his headlight on his picnic table, make limited motions with his hands, if any at all, then walk five steps back to his tent, shine his headlight at his tent, then walk back to the picnic table, shine his light at us, and repeat it all over again. If this was just the man looking for something, he was on a cocktail of drugs. Once his light was on us for too long for comfort, I shined my flashlight on him for an extended period of time. It was at this moment when I went from annoyed to fight or flight. A chill ran down my back as I saw the outline of the man disappear in front of me and the light from his headlight bounce down to the ground, then fly across the ground from his campsite. It seemed to jump along the ground and into the bushes diagonally from both of our campsites. It wasn't like the headlight had been thrown, but as if it ran across the ground, like if it was on the head of a dog. I took my flashlight away and watched his light slowly come back out of the bushes and climb back up to the height of a person. The shadow figure returned back, walking out of the bushes and back to the campsite to continue the same odd behavior. There were no sounds at all coming from this figure throughout the entirety of the night. Sometime later, we went into the tent for shut-eye and the shadow man figure was still at his odd routine. The following day, the tent from the shadow man's campsite was gone, like no one had ever been there. I then found out that just a mile from our campsite was a small town called Elkmont Ghost Town with abandoned buildings and a cemetery up a trail a bit. I couldn't find any other stories of Elkmont mysteries, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other stories involving the Headlight Man. I took my super skeptic boyfriend on our first camping trip up to the Mount Adams area because I'd heard of some spooky UFO action in the area. We hadn't been dating that long. We saw some UFO action that defied his skeptic explanations in a dispersed spot, but nothing I hadn't seen before. Lights appearing out of nowhere, zipping along and then disappearing, lights appearing and joining up and then disappearing, stuff like that. It was pretty satisfying to hear him say, yeah, I have no idea what that was. A few months later, we were camping with his dad and stepson, who were both longtime veterans in the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. We mentioned the spots where we had camped, and his stepdad, who is not a believer of anything like this, said that the area we'd been in had been his beat for years. Without any prompting from us, he said, we were supposed to be up there looking for camp thieves. We never caught any thieves, but we saw a lot of weird stuff in the sky. When I pressed him for details, he got a little cagey, but he did tell a really creepy story about how these big black logging trucks with no lights would appear and steal lumber in the middle of the night. So he and his partner staked out one night to catch them. They were backed into the bush and had to sit in complete silence to let the truck cool down so nobody could detect them with heat or night vision goggles. The back of the truck was deep in the bush, meaning that only the forest was behind them. Then after over an hour of sitting in silence, these huge bright lights appeared behind them from deep within the forest. They were so bright he could see the entire outline of the truck, the antenna, the spotlights and their silhouettes in the shadow. This was the early 80s, so we're not talking LED lights here. He said that he'd never seen anything like it. Then the lights went out and everything was silent. No truck noise, no rustling in the forest behind them, nothing. I love the guy, but he has the imagination and personality of a potato. So there's no way he made this up. That's why it was so creepy and believable to me. He had a few other stories, too, that I'd love to get more information on. I, for one, believe him. A 
About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington state. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before, and so has my husband, but we've never stayed there before. To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or yelling or something. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals, and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. So here we are at this campground. The first night, everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day, we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also must say, while I have read a lot about sleep paralysis, I have never experienced it until this night, and I have not since. Once we were all in bed, I started to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me in kind of what felt like a blur, but I'm unable to shout or scream or move. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot tall or so demon-like thing. It has horns and it's difficult to make out its face and it's terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming, are you okay? I told him I was fine and tried to go back to sleep, but the same thing happened again, except this time the demon was closer to me. I remember shouting in my head, Jesus is my savior, go away, but he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm and wakes me up, saying I'm still screaming. At this point, I still told him I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more, and the same thing happened again and again, and every time, the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, he wouldn't leave, and again, my husband would wake me up. Eventually, I told him what was going on. He said he was sorry. This time, I didn't try to fall back asleep. I wrapped as much of him as I could around me and desperately tried not to sleep. I felt like something was trying to pull me towards sleep, but I fought it. Next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I have never researched the area. I can't remember the name of the campground. Because I was so terrified, I haven't really shared this story until recently. I was out walking the woods at an ungodly hour of the morning. I believe it was around one to two in the morning. Last year, I was working at a church youth camp in Wisconsin. The camp was on two sides of a highway and a tunnel under the highway connected the two sides of the camp so that the campers could more readily access the other side. My then girlfriend and our friend liked to walk the woods at night after we were done with work. The first time we had done this, we were scared shitless by a fox barking. The deer in the woods were fairly docile and didn't spook easily. We soon learned to identify the sound of the fox, and we saw it several times. One night, it was just me and my ex-girlfriend walking through the woods. As we rounded a corner in the trail, I noticed movement in the field by the tunnel. Gray shapes. I assumed they were deer, and I pointed them out to my girlfriend. We continued our walk past the tunnel. Just as we passed the entrance to the tunnel, maybe about 20 yards, we heard the most horrendous screeching. It sounded as if somebody was being strangled. It did not sound at all like the fox, but we shrugged it off. We continued up the road. All of a sudden, I had this weird feeling, and I turned around to see a tall figure standing in the road. It was dressed in white, and it was all hazy. 
I wondered if I was a little too tired and was seeing things. So I poked my girlfriend and asked her to take a look behind us. She immediately noticed it too. Something we both noted was that our eyes kept sliding off the figure. It was like we couldn't keep our vision centered on it. I was thinking this and she voiced it without me saying anything to her. I pulled my hunting knife from its sheath, but I somehow knew that it wouldn't do anything. Without looking away from the thing, I said, let's go, now. We backed away and then started running, and we didn't stop until we were back to the cabins. When I got back inside the cabin, the guy in the bunk next to me was still up texting his girlfriend. I quickly told him what I had seen. He looked at me and said, that's why I don't go out at night. I never went back out into those woods at night again. And when I talk about this, I still get chills and a nervous feeling. We had no drugs or alcohol. We were both under 21 and we were working at a church camp with strict policies. So I have no idea what we saw. One night, in the spur of the moment, my best friend, my girlfriend, and I went camping on the banks of a creek that I lived within five miles of. We grabbed a 20-pack of beer, some blankets, and some cigarettes, and headed out in my piece-of-shit van with good spirits. It was about a week to ten days before Halloween, so it got dark on us pretty quickly. We made haste and gathered firewood with flashlights, ignited a fire, which rapidly grew hot, and threw off a lot of light, which allowed us to gather enough wood to chill and drink a couple of beers. We broke out the boom box and commenced having a good time. A few hours went by very quickly, and my girlfriend went to the van to sleep, although I don't know how, as it was pretty cold away from the fire. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend got off work at midnight and brought us more beer, though we didn't need it, as we had only drank about half of what we had initially brought. Those two got in an argument and she left. We watched as her taillights faded into the night. Then the weird stuff started happening. This place wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was secluded, but we could see farmhouses from where we were. It was far enough tucked out and cold enough where nobody would be screwing around anywhere near us. All of a sudden, my buddy goes, screw that woman, and turns up the radio as loud as it would go, but not for long. It was about that time that I heard what he was talking about. A distinct woman's voice from across the creek scream in a guttural way, help me. I looked across the fire at my buddy to see him look as pale and sheepish as I felt. He turned down the radio before I could say anything. Dude, did you hear that? He said. He grabbed his cell phone and we both grabbed flashlights and shined them across the creek. He called his girlfriend to make sure she didn't have car trouble down the road. She was already home. That was like a relief and more stress at the same time. It wasn't her, so who the hell could it be? We stood there in the grip of fear. Lights shined across the water. We didn't hear anything for what seemed like forever. Just when we were about to chalk it up to imagination or jitters or something, we hear, help me. A woman that couldn't have been a hundred yards away from where we were standing, which was right on the opposite bank of the creek from where we were. We quickly shone our lights to where the plea for help was coming from, but there was nothing there. We both called out, hello, where are you? Hello? No response ever came. Being experienced in the outdoors, we both knew that if she was being attacked or chased, there would be other noises we could hear, like rustling in the fallen leaves, or as close as it sounded, some more cries for help or twigs snapping or something. By this time, whatever buzz we had from the beer was long gone. We began gathering whatever we could grab and I woke up my girlfriend and commanded her to start the van and that we were leaving. She promptly did this and it's probably a good thing that she did because what came next still scares me to this day and is completely unexplainable. As we were piling in, we hear, help me 
come from the very back of the van, which was in the complete opposite direction of where the screams had been coming from. Needless to say, we left the beer and radio and got out of Dodge. I had my girlfriend get out of the way and I burned out, nearly wrecking the car in the process. I drove the dirt road about 60 all the way out. This happened in October of 2002 and I can't reconcile what it was. I tried saying that it was maybe coyotes or foxes. They make a yipping bark and a really scary scream respectively. There aren't any mountain lions within 500 miles of this place, so it wasn't that either. But whatever it was spoke, and to my knowledge, none of those things do. Whatever it was, it scared two 21-year-olds into leaving a case of beer behind. Honestly, I don't think I want to know what it was. Although, I think I have a pretty good idea. This is something that happened a while ago at a cabin that my family and I were renting. My sister and I were sitting outside on the back porch around 11 p.m., maybe getting closer to midnight. We were talking when we heard a noise. To me, it sounded like someone was clapping their hands, kind of like in The Conjuring, at least that's what it reminded me of. No one was outside, and the neighbors were pretty far down the road. So if it was someone, they would have had to walk all the way to the house and be standing pretty much right outside of it. The rest of my family were talking inside the kitchen. We could have heard them, and it would have been obvious if they were the ones clapping. It happened three times in three different locations. Once right next to the house, once in front of us, which would have been in the back, in the woods. And the third time came from the front of the house. I really don't know how to explain it, but it was pretty creepy. This happened around the time that I was 11 years old. My dad had just bought a log cabin in the woods of Maine. The place was completely dead, and while we had neighbors, we rarely saw them. We had already spent a few nights up there on a previous trip, about a 250 mile trip just to get there. We decided to take another trip up there for a long weekend. As this cabin was old, my parents decided to get some work done on it to make it more appealing. So they hired people to come and redo some things in the rooms. At the time, there was only one bedroom available for us to sleep in. As night fell, we all got ready to sleep. There were six of us in that one room. Mom, dad, me, two brothers, and sister. In the middle of the night, I wake up to audibly clear boot steps in the living room. The bedroom was connected to the living room. All that was between us was an old wooden door and a rusty deadbolt lock that would definitely come off if somebody were to kick the door in. As I was still waking up, I was in that foggy state that you are kind of when you're just becoming conscious. I wasn't all there. But then I heard the voice of my sister saying, do you hear that? So now I know that this isn't just part of a dream leaking into reality. I sit up quickly and look to the other bed and both of my parents and my sister are looking at the door and looking at each other. My heart starts to race, not knowing what to think. I then hear my sister say, are we going to die? which really doesn't help the situation at hand. As my other brother starts waking up, the boot steps stop for a moment and then continue. Mind you, there was no fading of the steps, which means that the sound came from a general area. We continue to just look at each other in fear and worry, none of us knowing how or why somebody would get into our cabin. As my last brother begins to wake up, 
the boot step stop. My dad then gets out of bed and grabs the machete that he placed under the bed and heads toward the door. Placing his ear to the door slowly to try to see if he can hear anything else, he can't. Then, in one quick motion, he unlocks and opens the door while wielding his weapon, prepared for anybody that might be there. He walks out into the living room, then to the other rooms to see if anything was there. But everything was clear. As a matter of fact, all the doors and windows were locked. There was no possible entry into the cabin, seeing as nothing had been tampered with. It was really hard to get back to sleep that night. As I woke up that morning, I remembered what had happened the previous night. I remembered hearing those bootsteps, and I even confirmed with my family that it wasn't a dream and that we all experienced the same thing. As there was no possible way that a person could have entered the house, I came to the conclusion that this was paranormal. I had my share of paranormal experiences growing up. My family and I have tried to debunk this a hundred ways, but we just can't come up with a solid solution. If you think you have a reasonable cause for this incident, let me know. And before somebody says it was somebody outside or an animal, no. I know for a fact that the boot steps came from inside the house. This was definitely one of the scariest experiences of my life. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old, and I was playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in Northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor and I, were playing hide and seek in the forest. The only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course, we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game and I wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure that it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too. And when I pointed it out, they confirmed that it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth, changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it for, I can't remember how long, but we reached a small cabin and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point and curiosity got the better of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it, but I did and I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars. Then a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled to the other kids to run back the way we had come and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could and we didn't stop until we were inside the house and I locked the door behind us. I remember getting in trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what we saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not even sure what I saw or if what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sounds of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight and I asked my mom who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults, what was going on. The adults had stayed over after the party and they were all just standing there, their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard. I stood there and tried to peek through the kitchen window with them. My mom says that they found the body of a woman in the forest and a cabin 
where her killer was staying. There was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night. The glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopter was only one of the reasons. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer, or maybe it was something more nefarious. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin that we had seen. Maybe they did, and maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to even go near the tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. I'm 24 now and have had many other experiences since then, but this is the one that I actually forgot about and was reminded of recently when reading up on Will-O-Wisps. I just thought I would share where it all began for me. My boyfriend and I rented a cabin in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. We arrived on Tuesday. By Wednesday morning, I awoke with a deep cut on my hip. On Thursday morning, we were awoken by the TV turning on by itself. On Friday, my boyfriend started seeing shadows out of the corner of his eye. And then that night into Saturday morning, we were about to go to sleep at 3.30. We stayed up really late. As soon as we turned off the lights to sleep, we heard a deep guttural growl that lasted for about two seconds. We both immediately froze and then turned the lights back on. Now we were wide awake. We then realized that pictures of one child in the house had been defaced and an extremely heavy chandelier started swinging. I'm not entirely sure what was in there, and we're not totally positive if it's safe to return. I think it was maybe three years ago when this happened. I remember that it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family and I's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food, last minute packages for some friends and something else. I don't really remember exactly why they went out, but that's not so important. My point is that I was all alone in our cabin. I was playing some games on my phone and listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me because I didn't really like being alone in general, especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had nearly forgotten all about the strange shadow. But then I saw it again, and this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment, so I decided to lock the door to my room. Right after I locked the door, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot. I asked out loud, what's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs was not my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers, and it was freezing cold outside. 
I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still. And even though I couldn't make out any eyes, I got the feeling that it was staring at me. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for maybe about 30 minutes, and I cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to enter ours. Ever since that day, I refuse to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling that I got that day in the cabin can only be described as unwanted. Like someone or something wanted to harm me. I still have nightmares about that shadow figure thing. Even today, it's haunting my dreams. This story happened a long time ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday, and so does my cousin. Our families were very close growing up. We were there often, usually just watching movies. We were young, and this was around the time that the killer clown thing was happening. So when we would watch movies, they would usually be horror. The Conjuring, Annabelle, etc. I was about 12 at the time. My cousin was 14, her brother was 12, and my brother was eight. We were in their basement one night while our parents and older siblings went out for the night. Babysitters weren't something we had. It was lock the doors, stay together, and don't answer the phone. My cousin's basement had a TV in the corner of the room, and on the same wall was a projector. My cousin, 12-year-old boy, and my brother had the hockey game playing on TV and Call of Duty on the projector, while my cousin and I, she was a 14-year-old girl, were sitting shoulder to shoulder on the couch, back to the wall with our headphones in, watching videos on our phones. Our brothers decided they were hungry and turned on the lights as they went upstairs to find something to eat. My cousin and I sat for about five minutes before her brother's bedroom door in the basement slowly closed. When the door came to a full close, the lights in the room turned off, along with the projector and the TV. I paused the video that I was watching on YouTube and first assumed that it was a power outage as I didn't believe in ghosts. But when I checked my battery, I saw that my iPod was still charging. Before I could do anything, I heard the sound of my brother and cousin laughing, almost giggling behind my head, as if they were right behind my ear. But it sounded off. It didn't sound exactly like them. It creeped me out, and my head shot up and toward my cousin, who was already looking at me with her eyes wide. Like I said, we were backed up to a wall, so there's no way anybody could have been behind us. Neither of us missed a second to get up and run upstairs. The first thing we did when we got up there was to look at each other. I said, you heard it too? She agreed, explaining to me what she had heard, which was exactly what I had also heard. We walked toward the kitchen and saw her brother. We explained to him what had happened. He didn't believe us and told us that my brother had been on the third floor bathroom ever since they left and they didn't talk or laugh. This creeped out my cousin and I even more, and when he went downstairs, everything was turned back on and the bedroom door was open. We talk about that night every few years, and it still creeps us out to this day. I'm not sure if I'm haunted or something, but I do have a lot of ghost stories that started happening after that night. Kids that I babysit keep telling me that they see things around me, 
or similar things from that night will happen to me in my basement, with or without other people there. Whenever I tell people about these events, they seem to have something happen to them afterwards, and stories come back to me. Usually the ones who joked about what happened or didn't believe in it had an encounter. I think something followed me out of her basement that day, but I don't know if it's evil, if that's possible. I still can't really explain it. It's just odd. So something just happened in the basement and I thought I'd tell you about it. Here's a little house layout to help a bit. Our living room has two ways to enter, one from the kitchen and one from the front door. The staircase leads right down to the front door. The way to the living room from the front door has you pass a hallway that has closets and the door to the basement. So it's 1.39 in the morning and I'm done scrolling through social media and decide to sleep. However, I want to cuddle with my kitty while I rest. I have a kitty sleeping on the headboard, but she's so peaceful I don't want to interrupt her. So I decide to head down to the main floor to find one of my other two cats. Down the stairs, I see my fluffy Newfoundland dog sleeping by the front door as usual. I decide to take the way through the kitchen to grab a snack. Then I come into the living room and I see my other cat sleeping in their cat tree. They look so peaceful, I decide it would be rude if I let one sleep and took the other one to cuddle with. So I let them sleep and started my way back into my room through the hallway. As I come to the archway from the living room to that hallway, the basement door slams all the way open hitting a table that we have behind it. I'm scared out of my mind and immediately turn around to go the way through the kitchen. As I approach the front door, I pet my dog and I remember thinking, maybe I'll see a ghost down the hallway. I can take a peek. My biggest fear is ghosts and demons, so I have no idea why I did this. I don't even walk to the hallway. I just peek around the wall. The basement door is swaying back and forth gently. I get even more scared and run to the top of the stairs, into my room, shut the door, pull up Reddit, and basically now dreading the fact that I have to pee because I don't want to leave my room. I want to say that it's the air conditioning, but down that hall, there are no vents. The only vent is in the laundry room, which is past a weirdly long hallway, and it has a door. I have no idea what could have made that door do that. So I decided to post this after the sixth person who has come into my basement has said that they feel off, overwhelmed, and like they're being watched. I usually bring them down to play billiards, and I have my old PS2 and Xbox 360 down there as well. The basement is finished, painted, and carpeted, and there's an office down there too. They always leave saying that they all felt the same things, and that they're so put off by it that they never want to go into my basement again. Yesterday, one of my friends left his mask in my basement, went back down to get it by himself, and said that he felt like his heart was beating out of his chest. I also want to note that when we first moved in, for the first month or so, we would find an unreasonable amount of dead centipedes across the basement floor, but only in the room with the billiards table. The office room never had a single centipede in it. All of a sudden, the centipedes just stopped. Never saw one again. It's been two years. I felt the same weirdness, but I always ignored it. I'm usually afraid of basements because I generally don't like being underground, so it wasn't unusual to me. But then everyone else started talking about it. 
I've also noticed that my house has become more active, as in lights turning on and off when nobody's home, doors opening and closing for no reason, doorknobs jiggling aggressively, things moving to very peculiar places. I really don't know what to do with this. This happened to me many years ago. I was maybe 10. I'm 23 now. My sister and I were over at her friend's house, which she had told us was haunted during prior visits. It was just us. Her mom was at work and her little sister was at daycare. We were down in the basement, which was half finished. It was furnished, but the walls had no siding yet. We were messing around down there, jumping on the couch, just doing kid stuff. We decided we were hungry, so we headed upstairs, shut the basement lights off, and took an immediate right at the top of the stairs into the kitchen. We were in there maybe a few minutes making sandwiches, when all of a sudden we heard the loudest, most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard come from the basement. It was absolutely terrifying. I don't know if three kids have ever gotten out of a house so fast. We sat on the curb across the street until her mom got home. I've had several encounters with what I presume to be the paranormal, but that was by far the most horrifying and memorable. It still gives me the creeps to talk about it, and to this day I'll sometimes text my sister to ask if she remembers it, just to make sure I'm not crazy. I like stories about the paranormal, but I've never personally experienced anything, and I tend to be pretty skeptical about them. However, there was a weird experience that I wanted to share and see what people thought about. Back in 2009, I was in college a couple of hours away from home. My grandparents, who I lived with through the last two years of high school, were away from home at their second property, where they were building their retirement home for the weekend and I wanted to get off campus. So my friends, let's call them Jess and Nina, and I decided to go to the house for the weekend. My friend Jess claims to be sensitive. She has told me stories about things coming into her room when she was growing up, and I can tell she's genuine. But to my knowledge, science has yet to demonstrate the existence of any kind of life after death, so I remain skeptical. I could tell something was off as soon as we pulled up to the house. I'm grabbing my bag from the truck, and I look over to her to see her staring up at the house. I ask her if she's okay, and she just says one word, ocupado, and then proceeds to grab her bag from the truck and we all head inside. Let me give you the layout. The house was built in the 80s and my grandparents bought the place in 99. The previous owner had died in the home, in his sleep, I think. It was a two-story brick home that backed up to a lake. It was quite a nice place to live, but there were also parts of the house that always used to creep me out for some reason. The front sitting room and dining room upstairs, and the stairs to the basement, where I lived in high school. But like I said, I never experienced anything. Anyway, my grandparents knew that we were coming down for the weekend, but they were going to be gone for a while, so they shut off all the water in the house except for to the downstairs bathroom. We all go inside, and a few hours later, Jess decides to go downstairs to use the bathroom. Nina and I stay upstairs watching a movie. She's gone for quite some time, and when she comes back upstairs, she asks us what we wanted while she was in the bathroom. Nina and I just look at each other, confused. We hadn't left the room and we hadn't called for her. We didn't know what she was talking about. 
She asks if either one of us had come downstairs and tried to turn the bathroom door handle while she was in there. We looked at her, incredulous, and tell her that we had not. She grows pale and my heart starts to race. I think someone is in my house. Nina and I grab knives from the kitchen and go room to room searching for an intruder. We find nothing. The house is quiet for the rest of the weekend. I still think about that sometimes. I don't know what it was. Maybe my friend was daydreaming and maybe she got into her own head. Maybe she was messing with us, although she swears up and down that she wasn't and she looked genuinely terrified. Maybe there was someone in the house, though I'm pretty sure we would have heard them opening a door. Also, there was a security system that beeped if any door or window were opened. I just don't know. What do you think? First, a little background information that's important to fully understand the story. My mother's sister and her husband have a house in Colorado that has a finished basement. The basement has a fully furnished bedroom, bathroom, a sort of living room area with a couch and TV, and a little kitchenette as well. I grew up visiting my three cousins, aunt, uncle, and grandparents every summer from the time I was five up until two or three years ago. I'm 21 now. The basement became more or less the guest room, so that's where I would stay whenever I would visit, so that I could have a little space of my own. That and the fact that their cat rarely ever went down to the basement, and I am severely allergic to cats. This particular event occurred around the time that I was 17 or 18, and my younger cousin, I'll call her Megan, was around 16 or 15. The night started totally normal. We all had dinner, listened to music, watched something, and then at around midnight, we all headed off to bed. Because of a different experience I had down there a few years prior, I was really nervous about staying in the basement alone. So my wonderful cousin Megan took one for the team and had been staying in the basement with me for the duration of my trip. We had been chilling in the living room of the basement for about three hours, drawing and just hanging out when it all started. I was in the process of explaining the premise of a show I had started when we heard what sounded like an old man clearing his throat coming from the bathroom. I knew it wasn't her since I was maintaining eye contact with her the whole time and her mouth hadn't opened at all. And she also knew it wasn't me since I was in the middle of speaking. And of course, neither of us are old men. We both paused and then confirmed that we had both heard the cough. Our minds immediately went to, there's a man hiding in the bathroom, since they had had some people in the past attempt to break in through the basement windows. I wanted to go upstairs and get one of her older siblings to check it out but Megan insisted on checking it out ourselves. We went to the bathroom, turned on the lights, and saw that it was completely empty. There was, however, a linen closet, which had the door closed. She opened the door, and we saw what honestly looked like the shape of a man trying to hide under some blankets. Megan immediately reared her leg back and kicked the blanket with full force only to discover that it was just some blankets spilling over the lower shelves that we had forgotten existed. As Megan tended to her now stubbed toes, we heard that same cough come from what sounded like the entrance to the basement. We slowly crept out of the bathroom, looked around the basement to no avail, and without a word, both started packing up all of our stuff, like our sketchbooks and my laptop, and Rather than leave the basement, we just went to the bedroom and locked the door. There was a giant floor-length mirror in the room which we used to bar the door. 
We did all of this in complete silence. Some weird primal understanding going on between us that we had to be as quiet as humanly possible. As we tiptoed around the room, we heard what sounded like shuffling outside the door. At that point, I was still somewhat convinced that there was a living person in the basement with us since the sounds were so clear and the feeling of there being someone else down there was so strong. Megan settled onto the bed while I sat against the wall next to the vanity, charging my phone. We were texting each other rather than speaking, since that pressure of being silent was still incredibly intense. We decided to each spam text her siblings, trying to wake them up to come down to our rescue, but there was no reply. Megan even texted her mom, but still, nobody woke up. I texted my mom, who did wake up, but all she said was to call the police if we were certain that somebody was down there with us. While we knew that there was something in the basement with us, we didn't know if it was actually someone who had broken in, and neither of us wanted to risk bothering the police for something dumb. After about an hour, Megan's phone started dying, so we decided to switch spots. For some reason, neither of us really understood. We were so terrified of making any sort of noise that we made sure to walk on our tiptoes and take steps at the exact same time to minimize the amount of sound we made. At one point, Megan started smothering me with a pillow because I had an allergy attack and kept sneezing. With the both of us now situated, we tried to relax, still being kind of terrorized by the sounds of someone shuffling around outside the door and the occasional cough. At around five, we heard what sounded like a small animal fall into the grate that also acted as a window for the basement bedroom and begin running around. The rocks at the bottom were moving and bouncing off the window, and then it went silent. About 10 minutes later, it sounded like another animal had fallen in and the sound started up again. This cycle continued for pretty much that entire hour. The entire time that all of this was happening, Megan and I were terrified. It was like that feeling you get right before your car gets rear-ended or right as you're about to go down a giant roller coaster hill. Just plain fear anxiety and the subtle feeling that something is just not right. It doesn't sound like much, but for some reason, Megan and I were just absolutely scared out of our minds. We both understood that we were not alone in that basement and whatever was down there with us was actively trying to freak us out. We were saved at around seven. The sun started to rise and we heard my uncle get up to take the dogs out. Neither Megan nor I had slept at all, and we suddenly felt exhausted as the adrenaline that had been fueling us the entire night seemed to die out. The sounds hadn't stopped, but they had significantly decreased as the hours passed. Now, hearing her dad up and about, we felt a little bit safer leaving the comfort of the bedroom. We quietly and quickly moved the mirror back to its space on the wall, and then, on the count of three, unlocked the door and ran to the stairs. We didn't stop to look around or turn off any of the lights, even though by that point the basement was fully illuminated with the sunlight and the lights that we had left on when vacating the living room. We booked it up the stairs and came to a screeching halt in the kitchen where her dad was making coffee. We immediately told him everything and begged him to check out the basement still not fully convinced that it wasn't a normal person. He checked and sure enough, nothing had been tampered with and the entire basement was empty. Megan made some ramen for breakfast since we were starving and just wanted something comfortable. And after eating, she went upstairs to tell her mom. I stayed downstairs eating and trying to come to terms with what I had just experienced. Her mom didn't believe her at first but when I told the same story and Megan almost started crying from not being believed, she changed her mind. My aunt was resistant to the idea that her house, specifically the basement, was haunted. But then, later that year, she experienced it for herself. 
The main thing I remember from this whole ordeal was the fear. It was so raw and intense, and there was just this weird knowledge that we weren't alone down there, and that whatever it was, was not good. Megan and my other cousin theorized that it was Theodore, the name they had given the resident ghost that stays down there, but I don't think so. Nothing like that has happened to anyone else ever again, and it's just not what we know to be Theodore's style. I don't know. I don't know what was down there with us, or who. I don't know why they were there or what they wanted, really. But there was something with us that night, and it scared me in a way that I have never, ever felt since. In September, my partner and I signed the lease on a dream apartment. I was ridiculously excited, and I kept telling everybody I knew all about it, to the point where I was probably pretty annoying. One day, a friend of mine came to visit me at work, and of course, I told her the news of our new place. She asked me where it was, and when I told her the location, she turned pale and seemed uncomfortable at best, and flat out scared at worst. She asked to see a picture of the inside, and when I showed her, she let out a long sigh of relief, then proceeded to tell me one of the creepiest stories I have ever heard. It turns out that about five years ago, she had lived in the house directly next to mine with her sister and boyfriend. Starting almost immediately when they moved in, they began hearing noises out in the kitchen area at night when they were sleeping. And occasionally, they woke up to the cabinets or kitchen tools being opened or scattered around. Eventually, they started to hear what sounded like kids talking in low voices in the kitchen at night, occasional crying and crashes that sounded far off, but still somewhere in the house. Around this time, my friend and her sister started to fight a lot, and she said that they'd both been feeling extremely irritable about everything. Their house was broken into while they were all at work one night, but nothing was stolen except for some cheap costume jewelry. There was cash, valuable jewelry, and designer clothing in the house, but all of it was left untouched. Later in the same month, they received a visit from the cops, who said a neighbor had called about screaming and crying coming from the house and had reported that they had left their children alone when they went out. They didn't have kids. The cops were called a few other times and finally got a search warrant. Somehow, they ended up finding a trap door under the kitchen window area that was covered in a layer of leaves and dirt. They found out that it was the remains of a very old root cellar. I live in one of the oldest cities in America, and much of the structures are built on top of older structures. That's not the surprising part. One thing led to another in the search down there, and the police recovered some very old skeletal remains of two children. Nobody seemed to know if the skeletons or the root cellar were there first. During all of this, my friend and her sister broke their lease and moved out of there immediately, as they were terrified to be there any longer. I went through with my lease and I live in the building next door to where all this happened. My apartment is an old adobe market that was converted into an apartment in the 70s, and it's been an absolute dream to live here. No scary vibes or noises at all. The couple who live in that house now seem pretty nice and keep to themselves. We all have high adobe privacy walls and coyote fences, and I feel tempted to see if they know about all of this. But I'm afraid it might make them uncomfortable if I approach them about it. In any case, that was the wildest story I've ever heard.
I'm going to give a little background first before I get into my experience, so you can all better understand. My partner and I are good friends with another couple that we often go over to hang out with. We'll call them Ashley and David. We go to their house about twice a week, and nothing out of the ordinary ever happens. We usually just hang out and talk for hours, with a few beers. David has mentioned a few times that he's seen Ashley's deceased brother around the house. Ashley always rolls her eyes and says she doesn't believe in things like that. Ashley took her brother's passing very hard, and she was very close with him. Fast forward to today. Ashley has a son that we'll call Adam. She called me and asked me to watch him since he was homesick from school while she went to work. I agreed and came straight over. Everything was normal. Adam was at the dining room table. He was playing a game on his laptop, still in his pajamas. He's a great kid. He never complains or gives anybody trouble. I went to the restroom, which is down the hallway past the living room. This bathroom shares a wall with the master bedroom's bathroom wall. As I'm doing my business, I heard the water turn on and off twice from that bathroom, followed by talking. I can hear what sounds like two people talking very fast, but it was muffled. I didn't think much of this, figuring that Adam must have wandered in there with the two dogs. He's nine, and he talks to the dogs sometimes as most kids do. I came out of the bathroom to find him still in the same position at the kitchen table, and the dogs were sleeping on the couch. I said, hey buddy, did you go into your mom's bathroom and have the water on? He looked puzzled and said, no, I haven't left this table, and I don't go in there. I then went to the kitchen sink and noticed it was dry, so the water I heard being turned on had to have come from the master bathroom. And what about the talking I heard? I chalked it up to maybe the next door neighbors. A few hours go by and Adam is on the couch with me, watching TV, and the dogs were there too. I start hearing things being moved in the master bedroom, almost like somebody was cleaning up, picking things up and setting them back down. The dogs then start to bark and run to the master bedroom door. This repeats every half an hour or so until David comes home. I explained my experience, and he just smiled and nodded. I asked him what he was smiling about, and he said, Ashley's brother's ashes are in the bedroom, and she recently got the ashes of her stepdad from her sister. She mixed the ashes. That's the talking you heard. Her brother and stepdad. They used to sit in the garage together and just chatter all through the night. At this point, I'm creeped out. David is glad that someone believes him now. I told Ashley about my experience, but she refuses to believe any of it. I personally think she's in denial, and I don't really blame her. It's scary stuff, and it's hard to believe unless you experience it for yourself. I've never seen anything paranormal before or after that, and I hope I never do, because hearing that stuff gave me enough chills to last a while. My friend Monica has been babysitting for this family for the past two years. She has been taking care of these two girls, both at the age of two. Nothing out of the ordinary has happened in the past, but recently there have been some strange events taking place. One normal day, Monica was just doing her thing, putting the babies to sleep in their own separate rooms, all cribbed up for nap time. After making sure that the girls were asleep, she left the room at about 1.30. A couple of hours later, at 3 in the afternoon, she went to check on the girls. What she found in one of the girls' rooms was very unsettling. The room was a mess. Ripped up diapers and napkins were strewn everywhere. The kiddo was fast asleep as if nothing had ever happened. Above one of the shelves in the room, across from the girls' crib, hung a cross in a sealed box that the family had gotten from the Vatican. 
They were very specific in telling her to never open the box or touch the crucifix. She immediately noticed that the box was open and the crucifix was on the floor. Mind you, the crucifix had been hung three meters off the ground, much too high for the baby to reach. She also found some angel deck cards on the ground, each attributed to a different saint or angel. She quickly woke up the child and made sure she was all right and unharmed. Then comes the strangest part of the story. After waking her up, she took her into the other room for playtime. Then, playing pretend restaurant, the little girl approached Monica, holding a piece of paper in her hand, which Monica assumed was the pretend menu for the restaurant. But when Monica took it out of her hand, she noticed that it was a pamphlet to do with the Wiccan religion and basic instructions for how to practice witchcraft. Monica, now obviously on edge, asked the little girl where she'd gotten it from. The girl pointed toward a book laid open on one of the stairs, which was unusual because she knows not to play with the books from the bookshelf and is normally very well behaved. The book was Wicca, A Guide for the Solitary Practitioner by Scott Cunningham. Ever since then, Monica has been a little on edge and she said that she's been having very strange and abnormal dreams. Some other important information to note is that the family is Catholic and they live across the street from Eastern State Penitentiary, an old suspected haunted former prison that closed in 1971. If you have any ideas, speculations, or know anything that has to do with Wicca or the book mentioned, please let me know. Monica wants to know the best ways to keep herself and the baby safe from whatever energy is in the house, because regardless of anything else, she feels that they are definitely not friendly. It was the year 1995, and I was a 20-year-old woman. I worked as a dining room manager at a popular breakfast restaurant. All of the employees would meet once a week at a local bar to hang out. I had to use my older sister's ID because I had just turned 20. I was excited this particular night because the manager that I had a huge crush on was coming. That night, I had decided not to drink too much and that would probably be the main factor in my survival. The guy that I had a crush on chose not to drink either. When closing time came, we all decided to go over to another coworker's house because we were still having fun. As I was leaving to get in my car, the guy that I had a crush on asked me if I wanted to ride with him. He said that he would bring me back to get my car in the morning. I happily agreed and I jumped in the car. As we were pulling out, he decided to do a huge burnout to show off. We got about two miles down the road when we saw police lights behind us. He pulls over and the police officer makes him do the whole, are you drunk dance. He wasn't drunk, but the police officer searched him and found a single pill that was not in its prescribed bottle. They decided to arrest him and take his car. I had told them that I was only 20, but they didn't seem to care. They told me to walk to the gas station and call somebody to pick me up. This gas station was the only place open being that it was the middle of the night. I didn't want to wake my family up, so I decided to walk the two miles back to get my car. I was afraid though, because I was aware that there was nothing open in between that gas station and the bar parking lot that my car was in. I started walking, keeping my eyes open for anything creepy. It wasn't too long before the typical abductor's vehicle pulled up. It was a big, black, windowless van. I was walking northbound, which made the passenger side closest to me. A man who was about 30 asked me if I needed a ride. I, of course, said no and continued on. He continued to ask a few more times, but he realized that I was not budging. I had that gut feeling you get when you know that something is just wrong. He just continues driving at my walking pace. He's looking around nervously. I had no doubt that he was trying to figure out how to get me. 
I was thinking of what I would do if he tried. I decided that if his car stopped, I was going to run to the other side of the road, back towards the gas station. At this point, I was about halfway back to my car. After keeping at my pace for a while, he drove off. For a minute, I thought he had given up, but he just went down a little bit and then turned around and drove past me. I watched him turn around again and head back toward me. He pulls up to me again and asks me to get in. I said, no, I don't need a ride. He just drove at my pace again. He would pull off every time another car drove by, but would come back after. Then, as we were getting close to where my car was, I was trying to decide how I could get to my car safely. The bar was in the corner of an L-shaped small shopping strip. There were about five stores on each side of the bar, with the bar being in the corner. My car was right in front of the bar, which was pretty far back from the street that I was walking on. He pulled off again, but this time, he pulled a little past the area that my car was in and parked, turning his lights off. If I had to keep walking straight, it would have been hard for me to get by where he was parked. I decided to count to three and run toward my car with everything I had. I had my keys in hand, pushing the unlock button as I ran. I kept my eye on what he was doing as well. He pulled toward me, slowly, but I think he was wondering what in the world I was doing running into a closed, dark parking lot. As I reached my car and jumped in, he pulled right in front of it. As I was locking the door, we made eye contact. He looked shocked that I had a car. I backed out and took off. I watched behind me, making sure that he wasn't following me. After I got home, I debated on calling the cops, but I thought nothing would come of it, so, regrettably, I didn't. It was about a year later, while watching the news, that I saw him and his van again. He had kidnapped and murdered a young woman. They actually believe he killed more than just her, though. I was devastated. I'm not sure if I had called the police if anything would have changed, but at least it would have been on record. I learned that people looking for victims will often drive around to bars at closing time, hoping to find a drunk woman walking home alone. I really do believe that not drinking that night saved my life. I wanted to share a few UFO encounters that I've had. The first was when I was about 11. I was riding home with my dad in the car. I looked out the window and saw a ship. It was shaped more like a small city, black with multiple spires. I told my dad and he saw it as well and gunned it home. The odd part was his reaction, which is connected to the next encounter. I asked about the ship and he went ape shit, started screaming about nothing being there and that we never saw anything, even though he described it when I pointed it out. Fast forward to about four years ago, which makes me around 34 years old at the time. I was at work at the hotel and the housekeeper calls me over. It's Veterans Day, so I figure she wants me to check out the parade. Instead, she points out a white sphere in the sky. We stare at it, and it moves at an insane speed, then splits into six smaller spheres. I tell her, congratulations on your first UFO sighting. It keeps moving around the parade, and I tell her not to worry. It's probably just observing. The thing is, when I asked her later if any more weird stuff came out, I got the same reaction. Total freak out screaming about not seeing anything and it not being real. It was like the mind couldn't handle the situation and completely melted down. This final one is a bit more interesting. I had let my dogs out at night for a potty break, then a head count as they came back inside. Before I went in, I noticed a star bigger than the others. Not being a runner, I stayed put. It got closer and I got a better look. 
It was a four-pointed star with mini points about the size of a pressure cooker, all pulsating different colors. I decided to try some telepathy. I mean, I didn't do anything fancy like cross my legs and say om. I just thought in my head, like you do when you have a grocery list. I asked it if it meant any harm. Give me red for no and green for yes. I got a red for no. I asked if it came from the stars. It turned green. I asked if it was just here for recon. Again, green. Finally, I thought, okay, you can be on your way. And it flew higher and farther. My point on the last one is to try to stay calm. It might scare you, but it's the best way to remember what you saw. I didn't get any missing time or the usual stuff like strange markings. It was just an odd encounter. So recently, I've been having really weird things happen at my house. Not only somewhat ghost related, but also UFO sightings at the same time. I just wanted to tell a couple of stories about my first ever UFO encounter. So I was lying in bed. It was around 1130 at night and I'm leaning to the side of the patio door from my bedroom. I'm thinking for a while when I look through the blinds to see what looked to be a glowing object hovering above my neighbor's house. On the rim of this craft, there seemed to be a color changing rainbow and then a few lights around it blinking. My neighbor has this really rich friend that sometimes comes to visit in his helicopter and that's what I thought it was at first, but I swear there was absolutely no sound. I also suspected that maybe it could be a star that flashes, but it was way too close. If it was a drone, it would have made some sound, especially that close. I was amazed at this craft and I didn't know what to think. Once I got back in bed, I heard what sounded like a plane circling my house. I didn't see it, but I heard it. I thought it could be a plane, but it sounded almost fake. I'm guessing if it was the UFO, they were trying to mask the sound of it or make themselves appear like something normal. When I took a look back at my neighbor's property, the craft was gone. Another story happened about the same time that I saw this other thing. Again, it was around 1130 at night. And again, I was lying in bed, looking out the window and just sort of daydreaming. Again, I could see a light. It was glowing really white and almost pulsating. I didn't want to go see what it was in fear that it could be ETs. From these experiences, I've decided to see what it is and investigate it. I really want to go confront them. I really want to go see what they are. My mom is very religious and no nonsense. She grew up brethren, which is basically an old form of Baptist that doesn't really exist anymore. Despite her upbringing, she's always been interested in aliens. I think it's because her dad also had an obsession with them, but I don't know why. Maybe he saw something during his trucking and military days. As a kid, I always caught my mom watching those alien and UFO shows. She really wanted to see a UFO for herself. One night she was traveling down the Appalachian Mountains in Western North Carolina, coming from a festival in Eastern Tennessee. It was fall, so the leaves were beginning to become bare and you could see through them. She was driving along with my sister and my grandmother when she sees what looks like three to five lights in a circular shape. It's getting really close. My sister and grandmother notice it too. Soon it appears to be behind them, very low to the ground. 
My mom opens the sunroof and windows, but there's not a sound coming from anywhere. Then, something my mom describes as an opaque white column comes down onto the road behind her car and is following. Like, the distance between the white column and the car never changes. My mom went from curious to freaked and guns it. I think the total time it followed was probably less than a minute. Eventually, it went away without a trace. When my mom finally got home that night and told me about it, I thought she would be excited, but it nearly scared her to death. She said she had always wanted to see a UFO, but that once she did, the experience left her terrified. I remember she complained about being unable to sleep for the next few nights. This was 10 or so years ago, but she still doesn't seem to talk about aliens with such frequency anymore. This Sunday gone, my girlfriend and I, who live in Adelaide, Australia, had just gone on a dinner date. She is a 26-year-old female and I am a 24-year-old female. We went to her house to drop off her doggy bag. Then we drove back toward my house, southward. About halfway between our houses, I noticed three lights in the sky in a perfect triangle. It was very odd and the lights were fairly obvious in the dark sky, especially because there were also stars visible, so the lights were very visibly different. They were a lot brighter and bigger, though not by much. I pointed it out to her, and immediately she said, holy cow, what the heck is that? At first I thought I might be seeing things, but when she reacted, I knew it wasn't just my eyes playing tricks. We quickly noticed that the lights were moving at about the same speed we were, and it started to flash green and red sporadically. We decided to follow it for as long as we feasibly could. It was a bit of a thrill, if I'm being completely honest, following the mystery lights in the sky, but it also didn't last very long. Maybe five minutes past my house, the lights took a turn, sped up, and just disappeared. We pulled over to see if we could find it again, but we didn't have any luck. We kept talking about how strange and cool the whole thing was. I am telling my story here to see if anyone else has seen something like this or has any ideas of what it could have been besides a UFO. Our first thought was a helicopter, but there's no realistic way for a perfect triangle of lights to come off of that, and they moved way too quickly. If anyone has ideas, I'd love to hear them. The year was 1976. We were living in the Middle East. My father was in the secret police called Sabak. It was common that a helicopter would land in our backyard and pick my dad up for a mission or something like that. One night, I saw a bright light and it got my attention. I thought it was my dad returning home on the helicopter landing in the backyard, but I guess it wasn't. But I don't remember anything after the light got really close. I woke up in bed the next day. Well, I thought it was the next day but I found out that a few days had actually passed. My father was standing next to my bed with two well-dressed men. One was American, I think, and the other was a translator. He introduced one of them as Mr. John and told me they wanted to talk to me. I was confused and they asked a lot of weird questions. Soon after my dad took me, my brother and sister moved us to the UK. We lived there for three years until my next strange encounter. Once again, one of the original two men, Mr. John, with a new guy, questioned me once more. A few months later, on the 4th of July, 1979, we moved to the US and we have lived here ever since. As time went by, I asked my dad questions about the moving and the men questioning me, but he would never talk about it. 
until recently when he was diagnosed with dementia. The things he said were incredible, too incredible to be true. I thought it was the drugs or the disease. I thought that's pretty cool if it was true, but there's no way. Well, he's in a nursing home here in Laguna Hills, California, and I went to go visit him. When I walked into his room, to my surprise, he had a visitor, a man. Not just any man, but the one that had met with me twice before, a face that I'll always remember. The only problem was that the last time I saw him was 35 to 40 years prior, and he hadn't aged a day. I was older than him. He saw me, pulled his cap down to cover his face, and left without a word. I asked my dad who he was, and he said to me, that's Mr. John, and remember, buy Safe Moon. I can't make heads or tails of it to this day. I will never forget this Wednesday night as long as I live. It was the summer before seventh grade, sometime in July. It was Wednesday night, early Thursday morning. The evening before, my family had watched the old school show, Unsolved Mysteries. I awoke in the night, lying on my right side, awake, but my eyes still shut, completely silent. None of us ran fans back then to aid in sleep. I was awake and basically waiting to fall back asleep again. However, I decided to open my eyes. On the right side of my bed, right there, was a being seemingly fixated on a plush bear that I kept in bed with me. And this being fit all of the descriptions that I've always heard or watched on television of an alien. Shorter, pale gray skin, and those awful eyes. Huge, black, and slanted, staring at my bear, right by my bed. Honestly, I cannot put into words how I felt right at that moment. I was only just about 12. At some point, I pulled my covers over my head and felt an awful rushing through my body of super warm, then cool, then warm again. Only later in my life did I understand that I was most likely feeling shock. I couldn't scream. I felt frozen. Too scared to scream, maybe. What if I did scream? My mother and stepfather and two brothers would hear me. What the heck would they do if they came running into my room and saw this thing. What would it do? Is it going to kill me? Abduct me? What if it already had and it was returning me? All of these thoughts plus a million more just raced through my young mind. It's awful just recounting it all. Again, how could I ever forget something traumatic like this? So being such a brave 11 year old and after what felt like 12 hours, I decided to try and scare it. I decided that I would thrash my legs up and down from under my covers as hard as I could. I know, horrifying, right? I was so petrified though. So I did this and then remained under my covers, just waiting. Nothing happened. So I stayed under the covers. This had to be at least close to going on two hours from when I first opened my eyes and saw this thing. As I lay wide awake, I heard a noise. To this day, I still can't explain exactly how it sounded. The sound felt as if it surrounded me and was coming from outside. It was crisp, clean sounding, maybe mechanical, but maybe not, lasting only about two seconds a sound that I had definitely never heard before and have never heard since. As soon as I heard the sound, something in my mind told me, oh, they're gone. As crazy as it sounds, I firmly believed that the sound was their transportation leaving. 
Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night or early morning. It took me so long to confide in my family about this terribly scary incident. Of course, they did not believe me. However, now, from time to time, my mother will mention it and suggest that maybe that's why I suffer from insomnia now. Very well could be. This is the first time that I've shared this story publicly though, and it would be reassuring to hear any other stories of similar happenings. My first ever encounter was when I was around seven and my family was all around the table. I will never forget the order we sat in, nor what happened. My mother sat in front of me while my sister was beside me. Father was next to mom and my back was turned to the kitchen. My brother sat next to my mom in front of my sister, a family of five. We were eating and then the window straight across from my dad at the right of my direction shone with a very bright light. Everyone seemed frozen, but my mom and I. My mom told me to run, run and hide. My mind was blanked out and I didn't think at all. I just got up and ran to my mother's room where I felt my mind was telling me would be the safest place. Once I entered my mom's room, I went straight to her king size bed with a huge light underneath. There was nothing under my mom's bed because she kept everything in bins at the foot of her bed and closet. The foot of my mother's bed was facing the door while the head was against a wall next to two big windows. Then it was her closet across from where you were laying so you could see it. Then the bathroom was right next to that. Once I got under the bed, I saw that the light was still on. I looked through the cracks and it was quiet. And then I saw about six sets of feet that were not human. Then I felt them start to surround me. One almost touched me by getting on the bed and reaching down through the crack. There were two through the crack, three in front, not showing their faces, but trying to reach further under. One was at the foot of the bed. Then I looked near me and saw a face that was gray and had huge eyes. I felt like I couldn't move, but when I looked closer, I saw a whole galaxy in its eyes. It was so pretty how the colors merged like a sunset, and for a second I almost forgot it was an eye. Then it moved or flinched and I came to my senses. I looked around and they were still moving to get me, while the one that I looked at was staying still and looking at the closet. Then I heard the closet door opened and I saw Nega. Nega was my childhood imaginary friend that taught me the greater lessons than what is now being slowly forgotten. After seeing her, I relaxed and I saw them try to fight. And then the tall, gray-like humanoids were gone. I looked at Nega and then I looked at the bathroom to see another creature that had orange eyes that I know commonly stays in my mother's bathroom. Nega hushed me and then I seemed to have forgotten what had happened until I turned 14. After this, I just carried on with life. I never saw my imaginary friend again, but old friend still lingers from time to time in my memories. So this is a true story that happened to me, which I'm weary to share, as there have been many times where I've opened up only to be met with ridicule. But I hope you take this seriously, because I do. Back in 2008, my girlfriend and I decided to go to an abandoned mental asylum off of Highway 82 in Alabama called Old Bryce. It shut down a few years back due to malpractice, and some of the ghost legends like the number two ghost, involve murder by staff at the facility. Essentially, this was a dumping ground for people that society didn't know what to do with. Thousands of people were sent there and died there. The facility consisted of four buildings, Bryce, the residence hall, S.D. Allen, the medical facility, the crematorium, 
and the guard shack. I have seen two ghosts in the residence hall, the bigger of the two I'll share with you now. My second visit to old Bryce was strange. It was my first time inside the building, and I came prepared. It was me, my girlfriend, and our friend Chris. I had a flashlight and a DVD camcorder. Through the main entrance is a staircase on the right, which zigzags up to the second floor, complete with an anti-side fence at the top. Make a left, then another left, and then a quick right, and you're in the hall that led to the children's corridor. I had the flashlight in my left hand, and my camera in the right, scanning, trying to catch something. On the left at the entrance to that room, there was a bathroom with only a tub in it. I thought I saw something in the bathroom and shined the light that way, nothing. I moved the camera and light, thought I saw it again and shined it back, nothing. Our night continued and finished without incident. The next day I reviewed the footage. In that bathroom, I shined towards something I thought I saw and I was right. When the light pans to the right, a bluish-white, illuminated little girl's face peers out from behind the door to follow the light. As the light shines back in her direction over the course of just two frames, she's behind the door halfway, and in the next frame, she's gone. My heart felt like ice water had run through it. I was in such shock. I proceeded to show everybody I knew. The girl's appearance was that of a younger one, maybe 10, hair parted in the middle, an unusually large forehead, and was deformed in some way. I made the mistake of leaving the camera at a friend's house overnight, who apparently was not my friend because he stole it. This is where it gets even weirder though. Two and a half years later, I was living in a different city. One of the legends of old Bryce is that windows grow back, and if you do any damage to them, spirits will follow you home. I broke a window on accident. I was laying in bed one night at about 3 to 4 a.m. I was on the verge of sleep, aware of where I was, and very comfortable. Out of nowhere, this immobilizing, tingling sensation started at the tips of my toes. I was laying on my stomach with my arms under the pillow, completely helpless, as this sensation crept its way slowly up my legs, midsection, and eventually my entire body over the course of maybe 20 seconds. Once it covered me, I heard the whisper of a little girl directly in my ear say, I'm in your room. I cringed tightly, and for some reason I said out loud, I love you. The feeling stopped, and the whole incident left me on the verge of tears. It may or may not have been that little girl from the asylum, but according to legend, it makes sense. I had moved into a new apartment with a roommate who was related to a friend of mine. This apartment was located on the opposite side of town, and I was not familiar with this area when I moved there. A lot of these apartments were literally newly built, but a lot of the lots around the area were still being developed, and it was a very desolate part of town. Most of the area, before construction began, was large amounts of old farm areas that were unkempt and no longer lived on. I am very sensitive to the paranormal, and during this time I was just beginning to understand why there was so much paranormal energy around me. My fear was literally a beacon, as my aunt explained to me. The very first event I experienced after moving into my new apartment happened within a week. At the time, I didn't have my own car, and besides getting rides from friends, I mostly had to take the bus to get to work. The bus stop that I had to walk to was pretty far away from the apartment complex. There was a lot of new construction everywhere on that road in front of the complex, but there was a gas station and a very small shopping plaza that was mostly empty, 
except for a bank and a small mom and pop grocery store. I used to sometimes stop at this grocery store and get some Starbucks iced coffee before walking to the bus stop. One very early morning, I want to say maybe around 5.30 a.m., I was walking to the bus stop. I had my earbuds in and I was just walking along, not really paying attention to my surroundings. Suddenly, I got a very cold chill up and down my spine and I got the distinct feeling that someone was walking behind me. I turned around, but nobody was there. I got a little nervous and left one of my earbuds out just to keep myself a little more alert. I continued walking and was almost to the shopping plaza when I heard running footsteps behind me. I turned around again and even though I continued hearing the footsteps and was totally frozen in fear, I didn't see anything. I couldn't move a muscle. And then I heard something rustle in the bushes next to the sidewalk very close to me, and the footsteps stopped. I caught my breath, and for some reason the energy that I felt was not a positive one. So I decided to sprint to the little grocery store in the plaza. I calmed myself down long enough to walk over and buy what I needed. Then I realized I had at least another seven to eight minutes to walk to get to the bus stop. As I near the door to leave the store, in the parking lot, I see as clear as day a figure of a man that seemed like he was standing in his own fog. I honestly couldn't tell any of his features, but as soon as he seemed to realize that I saw him, he vanished before my eyes. I looked around to see if maybe anybody else had seen it, but it was 5.50 a.m. at this point, and no one was in the store with me except for the person at the register. I gathered my courage and forced myself to walk to the bus stop. As I'm waiting for the bus to arrive, I again started to feel a shiver, and my heartbeat quickened. I got up from the bench where I was waiting and began to look around, but I couldn't see anything. Then, I swear as I breathe, I heard directly in my ear the voice of a man say, I'm sorry. As I'm typing this story out, I literally have chills just remembering the sound of his voice. I instantly knew that it was the figure I had seen in the parking lot. I stood there so freaked out, almost in tears, and the bus finally came to get me. After this happened to me, I paid my friend to drive me to work for the next two months. A lot of other weird things have happened, but this tops the list. middle school teacher and coach in a rural area outside of San Antonio, Texas. As a part of my coaching contract, I have to get my CDL and bus my athletes to and from games. After our last game of the volleyball season, I was driving the bus back to the bus barn. It was around 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, so it was already super dark and there weren't many cars out. But I've driven this part a million times, and I was just excited to return the bus and get home to my husband and dogs. The bus I had wasn't anything special. It was just an old sub bus from 2004. There are cameras inside that don't record audio, apparently, and a few switches were broken. But as long as the brakes worked and the bus got as close to 50 miles per hour as it could, it was perfect. I was approaching a bridge when a whispering voice began to speak through the radio. This didn't surprise me much because there's usually an interference near this bridge due to it being near the train tracks. Plus lots of cops hide here to catch speeders. I wasn't really familiar with the way these radios worked, but it helped me feel better about it. The closer I got to the bridge though, the louder the whisper through the radio was. I began to make out words like slow, sit, and no. 
As soon as I started to go underneath the bridge, I did a mirror check just to make sure I had enough room on the sides. Everything seemed normal, until I looked in the inside mirror that could see all of the seats behind me. Sitting in the very back row on my right was a figure. It was pure black, just a black abyss sitting straight up in the seat as if it was one of my athletes. At first I thought it was a shadow, but as the bus moved, it stayed put, unlike the shadows around it. After about five seconds, as I pulled away from the bridge, the figure vanished. The voice on the radio had paused, but then I clearly heard it say in a static low voice, turn around. I snapped my eyes forward, terrified, and pressed the gas a little harder, praying that I could get this old bus to go faster. The bus bar and gate was open and about 50 yards away, and I only stopped when I parked the bus. I did a quick sweep of the inside to make sure that nobody had stowed away and that this was some kind of prank, but there was nothing out of the ordinary. I asked the other coaches the next day if they had ever had any weird experiences around the bridge, but they said no. I'm going to ask the coaches at the other schools as well. I did get a chance to tell this story to one of the bus drivers that I get to see most mornings during the AM drop-off. He's an older driver who's been around since 2001. He mentioned that gangs used to race down that stretch of road all the time back in the early 2000s. One day, a race ended in a fiery crash just before the bridge, and a young man lost his life. The bus driver had heard similar stories to mine about the radio near the bridge, but never had anybody said that they had seen an apparition before. I asked if he knew of somebody I could contact to see the footage from the camera on the bus, but he laughed and said that they would probably think I was crazy and drug test me on the spot. This was the scariest experience I've ever had driving a bus. I pass that bridge every day on the way to work and it just gives me chills. I don't have to drive a bus again for another three months, but I'm already dreading it. I wasn't sure where to tell this story, and I probably sound crazy, but this definitely happened. A while ago, I was on the bus back home with my little girl. We had just had a really fun day out. I felt this strong energy, and I wanted to investigate, but with my awkwardness, I just kept my head down. Although I kept thinking, what is it about that group of older women that was in the front? And why does it feel like this energy is coming from that direction? This was not just somebody giving off vibes. The feeling was so intense. I'm usually good at reading people, but this just hit different. It wasn't bad either. It felt warm, inviting, familiar and so intense that it made the air around me feel tight, but not in a suffocating way, like a hug from your grandma. I decided to properly look, and this woman caught my attention straight away. Not long after, it was her stop, and I never saw her again. A week ago, on the way home again, I feel this energy again. I look up, and lo and behold, it's the same woman. At this point, the energy was so intense that I nearly got teary-eyed. She started to smile at me when I started feeling that way, but not in a creepy way, just kind of happy. She was sat on the folding down chairs at the front and kept looking down the aisle. I knew she was noticing me, but not making direct eye contact. It felt like she knew that I knew. I know this may sound ridiculous, and it was just based off of a feeling, but it's a feeling I haven't been able to shake. I'm still not entirely sure what happened, if anything. 
but it was interesting and I wanted to share. Just this weekend, my cousins from the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visited me and my family down here in southern Pennsylvania, near Maryland. We live in the boondocks, and there are many trails for people who enjoy horseback riding and taking rides on ATVs. When my cousins got to my house, we decided to go exploring toward my neighbor's house, who lives in the middle of the woods, isolated in a log cabin. We walked a trail the whole way up there for about a mile, joking along the way. Let me give you a little backstory about the place. Back in the 1800s, there was a bar and a few small cabins for people to stay in. A group of men got drunk one night and attempted to shoot bottles off of each other's heads. People died, and the wives of the men who had died burned down the bar and the cabins then were later hanged by the bar owners. This happened right below where we were exploring. Legend says that the women and the people who died in the fires still lurk around the forest. Another incident took place in the 80s or 90s. A teen was driving really fast with his friend at that exact same location as where the bar incident took place. The teen crashed into a tree, beheading his friend believing him alive. The teen was tried for manslaughter as he was driving drunk. This place is destined for bad luck. So we're exploring on this trail, approaching the house. As we approached, we heard a very distant whistle, but we thought nothing of it. As it is spring and it was warm on this day, so there were birds around. But when we stopped to take a break, we heard twigs snap. We all froze as a giant branch fell, and then the tree. It was a dead tree that was easy to push down. I looked behind and saw a human figure. As it set in with my brain, I realized that it was a man in ripped, ragged overalls that had no more color, and a worn out, colorless plaid flannel. He looked no older than 40. He looked at us for a while and then ran at us with a bat-like stick while laughing like a maniac. We ran the other way until we got cut off by an electrical fence. Then we turned the other way. By this time, we were way off trail and in the middle of the woods. But I knew that all I had to do was go down to get back on trail. By the time we got the trail, we lost him. He looked real enough to us. But whether he was a spirit or a real person, we're never going back up there again. I'm a skeptic, but I used to be obsessed with anything paranormal. I lost interest as I got older. I used to believe anything that I would see on those weird History Channel shows about Bigfoot and UFOs. It's not like I think that any of this is impossible. It's just that I'm much harder to convince now. I try to take any footage or pictures of this stuff as rationally as I can. Usually, the simplest explanation is the explanation. Ironically, though, I saw something that no matter how hard I try, I cannot explain. Years ago, I was at a party at a house surrounded by woods, miles and miles of isolated Pennsylvania mountains. I got bored and I asked my cousin if he wanted to go for a walk. As we left the property, we had to go down a pretty deep slope that was crowded by rusted out cars which had been there for over a decade. We found a clearing with a shack that looked like somebody was in the process of demolishing it. And after looking inside, we went back to the party to grab my younger brother. This was back when I was still pretty invested in the paranormal. 
So before we walked into the clearing again, I got the camera ready on my phone, just in case. The sun was starting to set, and as we left the tree line, I saw it. Something streaked out in front of me. It was a line of small, bluish orbs, and honestly, the best way I can describe it is like the fairies in Ocarina of Time, except they moved so much faster. They were only there for a second, fading in and then fading out, almost faster than I could react. I managed to take a picture, but I thought, there's no way I managed to get that. With the sun going down, we had to investigate the shack quickly. I took a few more pictures of the inside and hurried out of there. When we got back, I looked through the photos, and to my absolute shock, I did manage to get whatever the heck that was. The photo came out strange, though. The photo was more like an elongated blob of bright yellow and white, not what I had seen. Surprisingly, nobody seemed to believe me, other than a couple of close friends who were into weird things too. Everybody told me that I was mistaken, and one friend even accused me of fabricating it. The worst one was my dad. This dude will believe any fringe idea or conspiracy theory. For example, he once got a ghost detecting app and was absolutely convinced that his dead cousin was trying to contact him from beyond the grave through a free iPhone app. Of course, he thought I was lying about this though. I tried to come up with some kind of explanation for what I saw, but I couldn't. I'm not going to say it was a ghost or a spirit because I would have no way of proving that. Electromagnetic fields can make people see things like that, but that doesn't explain the fact that I had a picture of it, even if it was different. I'm not convinced that it was any weather phenomenon either, since it was a bright, sunny summer day. And fireflies don't look like amorphous blobs of light on camera. Really, all I know is what it wasn't. I guess in true story fashion, those pictures are stuck on a phone and a laptop that no longer work. I am planning on trying to retrieve them at some point. I don't believe the picture had anything to do with the computer or the phone breaking, of course. I've heard people say stuff about ghost pictures causing electronics to stop working. But both of those devices were pretty old, and they didn't stop working until years after I took those pictures. Whether or not you believe me is fine, but I hope you enjoyed the story anyway. I have always believed in the paranormal. As a child, it fascinated me in many different and sometimes terrifying ways. I grew up in a mid-sized to small former coal mining city in Pennsylvania. My house at the time was an older, small, three-bedroom house in a historically lower income area. For as long as I can remember, I have felt the presence of spirits in that home. As a child, I would wake up constantly in the middle of the night, sweating and in fear that something was watching me from the far left corner of my room. That feeling never went away, but got stronger. I never felt alone while living in that home, always on edge. It got to the point where I was late in my teens, still sleeping with the lights on, because I was that terrified of the presence that lingered over me at night. In terms of seeing things, the only truly horrifying image I remember seeing was as a child. I was opening up my downstairs bathroom door and I saw my dog as a rotting corpse staring back at me. When I shut the door and reopened it, the image was gone. My dog was alive and totally fine at the time. My dogs would bark at random noises in the house and would sometimes bark at nothing at all but the animals of my house would never come into my room. They would always whine by the door and scratch until I let them out. I never really thought about that until now. One thing that would happen to everyone in the house was things going missing. Granted, we were a large family in a smaller home, 
but things were always moving around and never in the same place that we remember putting them. In my room, this was a constant experience that I could never escape. I suppose here I should put a content warning for mental health and mentions of suicidal ideation. One thing that always stuck with me was the way that that house made me feel mentally. Granted, my family dynamic didn't help the situation. It's much better now, but at the time, it was rocky. But the best way that I can put it into words was it felt like something was sucking the energy and life out of my existence. I felt the most depressed and suicidal I ever have in the span of four years while living in this house. During this time, these feelings of being watched and stalked were at their highest. I felt truly and utterly alone, and yet my presence was never alone. A lot of these problems would end up fading, but never really went away. My grandfather would pass in 2016, and since then, the entire energy of my house changed. My mental health improved immensely, and those feelings of being watched felt more comfortable and warming rather than cold and negative. You could feel a shift in the entire home's dynamic, and just our overall moods and emotions were more stable. I felt comfortable staying home alone and simply using a nightlight to sleep. The last time I lived in that house full time was in 2019. I moved away for college and would only go home to visit. I would be home for maybe two to three days with a five day visit for Christmas, but an energy was still there whenever I walked through that door. My friends from college would feel that same energy too. I asked my one friend as we were driving back from Pennsylvania to New York, where we were in college, if she felt like my house was haunted. And without any hesitation, she said, oh, a thousand percent. Let's flash forward to this year. My family moved from the city to the mountains. We're now living in a converted cabin near a lake, three miles off a dirt road. During the day, it's beautiful and serene. At night, it's really creepy. Just a darkness. I wrote it off, thinking I just wasn't used to the new environment, since I live just outside of New York City. The first time that I went home to visit the new house, I was only there for one day. The second time, I spent two nights with my friend from college. We slept in the same room, and she would tell me how I would talk in my sleep, something I've never done before. The second night, I would wake up in the middle of the night, shouting full sentences and having the worst time going back to bed. The next morning when I woke up, there were scratches all over my neck and upper back. My fingernails are not long, so there's no way that I could have done that to myself at all. That was back in April. More recently, I went home for three weeks. This would be the longest I would stay in the house thus far. I began to hear the voices of my loved ones clear as day in the middle of the night, despite those people being asleep or across the house from me. That feeling of being watched was back, and it felt more negative than how I even remembered it. I continued to talk in my sleep, to wake up in the middle of the night, drenched in sweat despite the room being freezing cold, and I would always feel uneasy at night. I'm back in New York and nothing has happened here. My family claims nothing weird has happened to them in the house. So I don't really know what to think. Am I crazy? Or is that presence back from the past to haunt me? When I was about 10 years old, I went with my dad to his farm. I spent my vacations there as a child. I don't have a very good memory of my childhood. I hated school. Everything was so bad that I think I erased almost everything from my mind. But that day is like a video of 24 hours that I have never been able to erase. I got there at night, and as soon as we got there, my mom called. 
I knew it was because I got some bad grades and almost failed at school. My dad was talking to her, and then he told me to go close the main door. As soon as I got there, I saw a humanoid figure, totally translucent. Only its borders were visible. And behind it, six floating light balls, alternating between blue and red. It was very tall, but its proportions were not distorted. It was exactly humanoid, but I could see everything straight through it. The dogs at the farm were surrounding it and barking at it, making angry noises. I was a very scared child, but that thing didn't scare me right away. I got curious instead, so I asked, who are you? And it took a step forward. I immediately started crying and ran back inside calling my dad, saying there was someone in there. He turned off the phone and without hesitation went to a wardrobe and took a shotgun hidden between some clothes. When we got outside, it had vanished, but the dogs were still barking and surrounding a certain place in the front of the house, farther away this time, but there was nothing there. It's a plain space with our house in the middle of it. There's nothing surrounding us. After 30 seconds or so, the dog stopped and came back inside like nothing had happened. My dad said that I had just seen an optical illusion of the lights from the bus that brought students that arrived around that time. I don't think so. I still have no clue what that was, and I've never had anything similar happen after that. But I remember that day perfectly and it's going to be about 10 years from the day now, next month. My parents recently bought a farm last year in Australia and have been building a property on it for their retirement. It's right beside a national park and reasonably close to the next property over. The only thing that sucks is that we have no cell service, besides the top paddock where they're building their house. Not too dodgy, right? Well, I'm a university student, 21-year-old female in my second year of nursing, and I frequently come up to the farm to help them out with their livestock and whatnot. At first, everything was fine. We had a small two-bedroom cabin in the lower paddock that I stayed in every time I came up. My room had a large window that faced the national park, and at night, when it was pitch black, it would really freak me out a bit, but nothing serious. Sure, we had the usual noises of foxes and livestock at nighttime, but nothing out of the ordinary. Things really ramped up when I had to stay there alone to feed the livestock for a few days while my parents were back in the city. I went about the usual chores, feeding the sheep, keeping an eye on our lambs, and checking in at the building site to keep an eye on everything. I went into town to get some dinner at the local pub, and by the time I got home it was roughly 10pm. I would usually take my car up to the top paddock at night to call my friends check social media, and so on. My car was lit up by internal navigation systems, which meant that I couldn't really see outside the car besides whatever my headlights lit up. I was midway through my social media scrolling when I thought I saw something black flash across the paddocks where my headlights were facing. I drove my car in a quick circle to use my car's headlights as a massive torch, but I didn't see anything. No reflections of cattle's eyes like I normally do, or the usual fox or rabbit. There was nothing. I tried not to pay too much attention to it, and I went back to my social media scroll. Until I accidentally pressed my brakes, which allowed my brake lights to flood the paddock behind my car with an eerie red light. The same black flash that I had seen through my front windshield flickered out of the corner of my eye in the rearview mirror. Now I was suspicious. I turned off the music I'd been listening to and just sat for a second, trying to assure myself I was just tired. 
After a few seconds of silence, I was relieved and was about to turn my car on to go back to the cabin. And that's when I heard what I can only describe as claws on my rear windshield. Tap, tap, scratch. I have never sped as fast as I did back to the cabin that night. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of something watching me from the forest. You know that sort of tingling sensation of something staring into the back of your head? After tossing and turning, I put up a newspaper in front of my window, the one that faces the woods, until it was completely covered. The feeling immediately went away. Still, it's safe to say that sleep did not come easily. The following night, I chose to go to the top paddock while it was still reasonably light. All was pretty peaceful and I had all but forgotten about the previous night's events. I was admiring the gorgeous pink sunset when I saw a flash of green in the sky travel for a split second and then disappear. Now listen, I'm not one for UFOs, but I know it wasn't a helicopter because it was light enough to see the sky and the stars weren't even out yet. I thought it was cool, so I called one of my friends who's a massive skeptic about everything paranormal. Of course, she thought I was nuts and proceeded to give me crap for it. It started to get a bit dark for my liking, so I went back to the cabin and cooked some dinner. All was fine, until I went to sleep, the newspaper from the night before still clinging to my window. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to a sound. I went to take a look on foot with my spotlight. Now, usually, when you bring a very bright light and irritate the sheep, who were already going nuts, you hear about it. Keyword being, usually. I walked over to the paddock and started scanning with my spotlight, and I didn't see anything. The sheep were bleating like crazy, but none were injured or even remotely in a corner of the paddock, huddled together like they usually do when there's a fox or a predator. That was, until they all went silent. One second they were so loud that they echoed around the hills, and the next, it was dead silent. Now I was truly scared. I raised my rifle and started looking around, feeling like everything around me had its eyes on me. It was then that I heard a thump of something heavy being dropped on the ground, heavy enough for me to feel the vibration in my feet. I booked it back to the cabin and locked everything behind me. I was pacing around, double checking the doors and windows when I heard it. It sounded like humming, but it was distorted and there were footsteps with it. These footsteps were not human though. It's like something was limping and then quickly recovering. Step, 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 around the cabin and stopping at my bedroom window. I curled to the ground, gripping my rifle until my fingers were frozen in place. And that's how I fell asleep that night. I left first thing in the morning without even looking to see if there were footprints or anything else. If anyone has any clue what's going on, or what this thing is, and can tell me what I can do, let me know, because I haven't been able to go back to my parents' farm ever since. I feel like I should start this story with a content warning first side. About three days ago, I had a pretty weird dream. I dreamt that the mother of my mom's friend committed suicide. I don't remember how, I just remember getting the news from her grandson in the dream. Never met the woman in my life. I only heard about her a few times about a month or two ago. Skip to today. My mom receives a call from the friend, and my stomach just drops. It's like I know that something's wrong. And it is. The woman had hung herself 
about a half an hour prior. What the heck just happened? Was it all a creepy coincidence? I don't have any emotional connection with that woman at all, nor had I been thinking about her before the dream occurred. My grandmother also had some dream predictions before, but no major events, just some random things. It's really unsettling to me, and I have no idea how to explain it. This happened to me when I was a toddler, from around one to three years old. When I was little, I used to have really bad nightmares. They were so bad that I'd wake up in the middle of the night, screaming like I was being murdered. At one point, it got so bad that my parents actually called 911 because they weren't even sure if I was breathing or not. What were these nightmares about? Being so young, it's pretty hard to remember, but I can recall two of these nightmares. In the first one, I was at my grandparents' house, playing with a toy on the floor, while my grandma was doing something in the kitchen. Then, their dog barked from the other side of the house. I heard my grandma yell, Hey! at the dog. As soon as that happened, everything went quiet. I looked up from the toy to see a tall, shadowy figure where my grandma had been moments before. It just stood there, staring at me. It didn't have any distinguishable features. It was like I was staring at the shadow of a tall, skinny person. The second one is a lot shorter, but it's the one I remember the most. I was in my crib at night when I heard something from the doorway I looked over to see the exact same shadowy figure staring directly at me from the doorway. I don't remember any of the other night terrors that I had when I was a kid, but I'm sure that they all involved this thing. It got to the point where I was terrified of shadows and loud noises. I understand why I was afraid of shadows, but for the life of me, I can't explain where the fear of loud noises came from. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that my grandma shouted at her dog right before the shadow person showed up. Maybe it had nothing at all to do with those nightmares. I really don't know. Normally, I wouldn't be concerned by this. For all I know, I saw something like this on TV when I was little and had nightmares about it. I wouldn't even consider it a paranormal experience. If my mom hadn't seen the same thing I did. She came home late one night to find the entire apartment dark. Assuming my dad had just left for work, she walked toward her bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway and across from mine. That's when she saw the tall shadowy figure at the end of the hall, in front of my bedroom. At first, she assumed it was my dad, so she got mad at it for scaring the heck out of her but the figure didn't move. She reached behind her to turn on the light, and the figure vanished. She told me about this years later, and my dad backs up the claim, since he recalls getting a panicked phone call from my mom saying that there was a ghost in the apartment. And that's where it ends. A few years later, we moved out of that apartment, and I have never experienced anything to do with that shadow ever again. Ever since then, I always sleep with the hallway light on, because I'll never forget the feeling of absolute terror I had when I saw that shadowy figure staring at me from the doorway. I've always been so fascinated with the paranormal, but I had never had any experiences. I'm from the Midwest, and one of the only things to do there is just to drive around and see the countryside. My friends and I did this aimlessly, and we had an obsession with cemeteries. 
We went to every cemetery we came across, and we found some absolute gems. One on a hill in a grassy field, where the stones are not even visible aside from brushing the grass apart beneath your feet. Another back in the woods with no markers across an old bridge. Just all kinds of spooky and quirky cemeteries. We had looked up local area haunted locations before, but no major sites that we could stomp around at, and we never experienced anything. We later go to college, and we still see each other on the weekends every other week or so. We always wanted to find one specific cemetery that was known to be haunted, but the location was kept a secret. My buddy's friends at college actually found it and went, and it turns out that they have to list the cemetery in county directories. That's how he found it. Anyway, he tells us that he can take us there, so we go. We went at sunset and tried asking questions and recording and so on. This goes on for some time into the night. We take it very unseriously, but we still wanted to encounter something. One of my friends puts his cigarette out on a tombstone to elicit a response. Yes, it was stupid and wildly disrespectful, and we were childish. We asked another question and waited. It was dead silent, and then we hear the leaves crunching, step by step, from the darkness toward us. It sounds like somebody stops right in front of us, but we see nothing. We wait there, silently frozen. And then we heard the most blood curdling scream I have ever heard. We were in a bit of shock. The whole event still seems like I made it up in my mind when I reflect back on it because it was so otherworldly. We slowly began walking and then eventually running as fast as we could toward the car, without a word between us. I still wonder if what we heard was a big cat or something, but where I live, those are pretty much unheard of. I have never heard anything like that scream to this day. We all still remember it, so I know I didn't make it up, and it gives me chills just thinking about it. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house. The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brother's. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read General Store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, 
The landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside, corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-styled dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting, as soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night. And if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars, just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school, and he hands me the binoculars and says, Look at the cow pasture. Tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away, so that night my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like, 
And also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell, there was no blood or viscera, and the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle, and eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moments scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. I'm a 30-year-old man, blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like boxer from Animal Farm. I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before. All of it going in through one earbud, while I have the other ear open, paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life. So needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk, and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, it reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast, and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. All I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at this store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. This happened a few years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is I was all alone in our cabin playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. 
I remember that suddenly I got really cold, so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time, because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me, because I really don't like being home alone in general, and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow, until I saw it again. But this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now, since I was the only one in the cabin. I decided to lock the door to my room, just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, What's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still, and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted, like someone or something wanted to harm me was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing even today. It haunts my dreams and I'm in no rush to see it again. I'm from California and way back when I was on the college search, I realized that I'd likely get to the East Coast if I wanted to play field hockey. My mom and I organized a road trip through Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to hit a bunch of different schools in a short amount of time. One of the schools was Ithaca College. It was a last minute decision to stop there, so we didn't have much time to explore the general area afterwards. We had been told by multiple people that the waterfalls in the area were beyond gorgeous and worth the stop. So my mom and I decided to swing by one before we left for Pennsylvania. We put Ithaca Falls in our rental car GPS and it brought us to this red curb loop and an old rundown overlook of the falls. This overlook was down a hill and through some trees. So my mom didn't want to leave the car on a red curb. She encouraged me to go down and check it out on my own, and I did. The first time I went down, I was sure to be observant of everything around me. I didn't want any randos in the woods sneaking up on me. I went to the ledge and took some pictures, sat and listened to the water for a while, and then turned to go back up. When I turned, I got this odd feeling, as if somebody was watching me or standing with me. I got uncomfortable and looked around. Nothing appeared to be wrong, 
so I calmly headed back up the hill. I got in the car, showed my mom the photos, and realized that I didn't take any video. My mom suggested that I go back down to get a video since we had time, so I did. The second time I go down, I feel a little less happy. I was down a slope, so my mom couldn't see me. I felt more alone and exposed than the time before, and that sinking feeling kept growing. I got to the edge, took the video with shaking hands, and now I'm feeling like I need to get out of there. I had an intense sense of urgency. I turned around to go back up, and some force stops me, dead in my tracks. I'm frozen there, like a rabbit or a deer frozen in headlights. I literally cannot get myself to move forward or take a step. An overwhelming sense of dread sweeps over my body and presses on my chest. Just such dread. I literally feel like I'm going to die. I still can't move and I sit there terrified as I feel a massive presence come up behind me. This thing felt big and so real, but I couldn't get away. I'm still stuck and helpless. I keep standing there, too scared to turn around, unable to move, when the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Whatever this thing was, it bends down toward me, and right next to my ear, it says, you who I kid you not. When I heard that, I ran faster than I have in my entire life. I tore up that hill, still too afraid to see what was behind me. I got in the car, slammed the door, and just like in a movie, I went, drive. My mom looks at me in disbelief and goes, is everything okay? I said, just drive. She told me later that I was pale and the sense of urgency in my voice told her that she had to get away from whatever I was scared of. What spooks me so much about this story is that I never turned around. It felt so real that it could have been a person, but I was standing right against the overlook. I don't think anybody could have snuck up behind me. And I've also gotten that sense of dread visiting other haunted places. I really feel like it was something paranormal. As for the Yoohoo, it didn't sound male or female. It did sound mean though as if it was trying to scare me or intimidate me. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but this one certainly takes the cake for the scariest. I hope all of you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as to what you think this was. I am a 23-year-old female, and my husband is a 23-year-old male, and recently we moved in with some roommates. They are James, male 26, Danielle, female 25, and their young daughter Sarah. We went from living in a decent-sized city to living in the middle of nowhere, about an hour away. For context, we live in the south of the US, so it's rural, woodsy nowhere. We're really good friends with our roommates, and husband and I knew beforehand that they had both experienced some paranormal goings-on before we made the decision to move in. To be honest, I think husband and I forgot all about the paranormal stuff just before we moved. Everything was great when we were settling. We all got along really well, and it was so amazing to be in a place where we had our own space and were on equal ground with our roomies. Then one night, about a month later, husband, James, and I are all lounging in the living room area. Sarah was asleep in her room, as it was late. We're talking about the paranormal. Around 11.30 p.m., James has to go pick up Danielle from work. She works the late shift, about a half an hour away from us. As James is getting ready to leave, he mentions skinwalkers. Now, husband and I don't use this word. For those of you who don't know, 
speaking aloud the word skinwalker or wendigo is sometimes believed to attract these deadly creatures to you. Husband and I had strange and horrifying experiences at the last place we lived after one of us made the mistake of saying it aloud. So we don't say it anymore. Our code word for it is flesh pedestrian if you're curious. As soon as James said it, I gasped. He laughed it off, but right before he left, he noticed something through the blinds on the back door of the house. He mentioned that he thought there was somebody in the backyard. In truth, we don't really have a backyard. The back of the house is right up against the edge of the woods, but we just call it the backyard. Husband and I, thinking that he's messing with us, laugh it off. Quickly though, we can see from James's face that he is not. We rush to look through the blinds, and sure as heck, there's something in the trees. It was incredibly hard to see, but it was a very, very tall and thin figure, darting quickly between the trees. It kept itself completely shrouded in the black shadows, and we couldn't make out any other features. James rushes outside, thinking that it's somebody on the property. Husband and I follow, not wanting him to be alone. I stay on the porch while husband rushes down the steps to follow James as he goes behind the house. The second he leaves my eyesight, James immediately turns around and shakes his head at husband. He tells us that as soon as he got to the edge of the trees, he heard a low voice saying, turn around. I come from a pagan background. My mother is Wiccan and my husband is also pagan. As James leaves, the husband and I finish our cigarettes. I immediately set out to bless the entire house with sacred oils and blessed salts. I had already done this as soon as we had unpacked the last of our things, but I felt it necessary to do again. I went so far as to bless the entire porch as well. As husband and I are doing this, James texts me that he doesn't feel safe and that something isn't right. When I ask him what he means, he writes that just a few miles up the road, a naked man came charging out of the woods and stopped at the edge of the road. When he locked eyes with James, he simply pointed at the car and kept doing so until he was no longer visible in the rearview mirror. We tried to rationalize that it could be one of many non-paranormal scenarios. We thought it might be a prank, but that didn't quite make sense. It was the beginning of a very cold winter, and it was only about 20 degrees out. It would have been a lot of effort and discomfort for this man to pull a prank like this on passing drivers. Then we wondered if the man needed help or was possibly in danger. But James was sure that this man did not look at all like he was in distress. If he was, the man would have yelled or tried flagging down the car instead of just pointing at it. The conclusion we came to, for the time being, was that he was most likely on some substances. We don't live in the safest of places, and hard substances are very common around here. Then James texted that he had picked up Danielle, and more weird things were happening. I asked him to elaborate, but he said that he would explain it all when they both got home. As their car pulled up in the driveway, husband and I went outside to meet them but the two of them quickly got out of the car and rushed toward the house, telling us that we all needed to get inside immediately. When inside, James explained that right before he got to Danielle's place of work, he saw something in a cow field that he can't explain. It was tall, taller than any human could possibly be, and much taller than the thing that we had already seen behind the house. From what he could tell in the dark, it was gray and it was running, running faster than he was driving at 60 miles per hour, on all fours. And then it ran into the woods out of sight. When he was driving back with Danielle, before James could explain everything that had already happened, she got a sinking feeling in her gut and made James lock all the car doors. A literal second after James complied, the same creature he had just seen was once again sprinting alongside the car. It was much closer to the road 
than it had just been minutes before, but it dashed again into the trees before they could get a really good look at it. We were all a bit shaken. It was now close to 1 a.m., and none of us could explain anything that had already happened. We tried to brush it all off, and we probably could have, if it was just one thing that had transpired instead of several. We made the awful decision to go back outside for a smoke, the kind of decision that only idiots in horror movies would make, I know. And that's when things got really weird. Off to our right, there's a small strip of woods that separates our property from our landlord's property, where he lives with his daughter, son-in-law, and granddaughters. In those trees, we notice three sets of eyes. They're glowing yellow-green, and they're just staring at us. Husband asks James if it could be deer, as we do tend to see a lot of those around, but we all knew that whatever those eyes belonged to were far taller than deer could be. Then, to our left, there's more, you guessed it, woods. From that direction, in the pitch dark, I swear I heard a little girl laugh. It wasn't boisterous or loud, more like the snicker that a child makes when they're trying to suppress their laughter. Danielle and husband didn't hear it, but James did. Now we're looking at the big tree to our left that stands just before the edge of the woods, and notice that there's this big black mass behind it, as though something was crouched next to the tree. We all try to rationalize that it's just a big bundle of leaves, but I don't think any of us really believed that. James and husband both dart back inside for a moment, and when they come back out, James is holding a hatchet, and husband is holding his crossbow. Without saying anything to Danielle or I, they step off the porch and walk toward our left, where the little girl laughed. Later, they told us that they thought a child was in trouble and they wanted to help. While Danielle and I were on the porch, trying to figure out what the heck was happening, we see something a few yards away. Down the driveway, there's a huge tree in the middle of the property. Out of our peripheral, we swore that we saw something duck from behind the tree. We kept looking at the tree, and yes, there was something poking its head up from behind the trunk, pulling back very quickly as soon as it realized we were staring at it. At this point, Danielle and I wanted to get inside, we're both shivering from fear and cold, and we just wanted this night to be over. But while Danielle and I were in a match of paranormal peekaboo, husband and James had their own very weird experience. For context, I have Tourette's syndrome. This means that I say and do things completely out of my control, and some of my verbal tics are just strange sounds. Some of those sounds include blowing raspberries or popping my lips which are my two most common verbal tics at the moment. As James and husband are inching closer to the trees, they both hear footsteps through the grass and leaves within the trees. Both of them were too frightened to call out to whoever they thought was in there. Then they hear shuffling. The problem is though, they each hear shuffling coming from different directions that the other doesn't hear. James was walking to the left, husband to the right. James hears shuffling coming from the right, but husband doesn't hear it. But husband hears it coming from the left, and James doesn't hear it. So they turn toward each other with their weapons drawn. In their confusion, while they're facing each other, they hear someone running in the woods, full on sprinting through the trees, heading directly toward them. And then it just stops. They take a step back, and watch to see if anybody comes out of the woods. No one. But then they hear something in the woods. They hear me in the woods right in front of them. They heard both of my verbal tics, but the problem was I was standing on the porch behind them. Without turning around, husband calls to me and asks if I just had a tick. I told him no. They back away from the woods without taking their eyes off of that spot until they're close enough to sprint into the house, pulling Danielle and I with them. 
Inside, Danielle and I are able to tell them about the thing behind the tree. And James and husband are able to tell us about how something mimicked my tics to a T. For the rest of the night, we didn't go back outside. We would all, against our better judgment, peek through the blinds out the back door when we passed it. There was still something in the woods every single time that one of us looked. I didn't get any sleep. Come morning time, husband and I checked all the places that we had seen or heard something, and there was no sign of anyone or anything. I asked my mother what she thought it might be. In her opinion, it was likely something related to a mimic spirit, a spirit that warps reality to feed on fear, but not having enough power to really hurt anybody. She said that it couldn't be a skinwalker because there were too many things happening in too many different places all at once. Skinwalkers are solitary and territorial things, so it couldn't have been multiple of them. But just one mimic could do all the things we experienced. We still hear the occasional giggle in the dark, get a bang or a knock at our back door. We still even see the thing behind the big tree in the driveway almost every night. But that night was something else. I've seen some things in my life, but never, never have I gone through about three hours of nonstop activity. I've since burned sage all throughout the house and the entire perimeter of the property, as well as using the rest of my salt and oil around the entire house. Husband and I even did a late night EVP session at all of the spots that things had happened that night, but we didn't get a single response to any of our questions. I don't know for sure if it was a mimic spirit, or if I can fully rule out a skinwalker. I don't even really know if the thing was dangerous or not. But one thing's for sure, I will never forget that night. This took place in Poland, probably in January. It happened about six months ago. I just had a chat with my friend and I recalled the memory. During winter, I used to go on these short hikes to my local forest. Most of the time, nothing out of the ordinary happened. The most unusual thing was seeing a wolf pack once and that's it. But this event happened at about 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. The weather was quite cold, about negative 10 degrees Celsius, and snow was lightly falling. There were no people out that day. One hour into the woods, I heard it. This weird music, which seemed to come from all directions at once, and it kept getting louder. It sounded like muffled piano, and something resembling jingles could be heard too. It went on for a solid minute and then slowly faded away. I was so weirded out that I didn't even take my phone out at first, but when I finally did, I realized that my phone had turned off, probably because of the temperature. After the music stopped, I decided to finish my hike anyway, as I found it more in the category of weird than frightening. The other strange thing though is that when I go out hiking, I always see deer, wild boars, hares, and other animals. There was not a single living being to be seen after I saw the music. What could it have been? This is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never really proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, my friends and I went out to do some shopping and get food. 
Upon arriving back, we noticed that somebody had left the oven on. Each of us denied having done it, but we knew somebody had to have left it on. Looking back though, this was probably the first unexplained incident, as thinking about it, nobody had even put food in the oven. Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans, movements from the side of her eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting, but myself and one other were not totally convinced. It was soon after that it was only me left unconvinced, as one day while the other non-believer was home doing some studies, they looked up to see a face peering at them before it vanished. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night just before Christmas to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling, making tracks across the roof by year's end. One of my friend's girlfriends swore that she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there are three switches needed to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night, and one room off the kitchen would just send shivers down our spines any time we were in there. There was one night in particular that really scared me though. I always locked my door before going to bed, and I distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes telling myself that it was just a dream and I went back to sleep. The next morning my door was wide open, so were all of the doors in my wardrobe and the guys had told me that it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other all night long. I hadn't moved anything. So many other things happened in that house, but this story has gone on long enough. I decided to tell my story after telling a Galway person about living in the estate, and without saying which house I lived in, he told me of a creepy haunted house at the back of the estate that a family he knew had moved out of a few years prior because of the activity. When I told him which number it was, he almost fell off his chair. It was the same house. I was around 24 years old at the time of this event. I have always had trouble sleeping, and I would sleep during the day most of the time. This particular day, I woke up way later than usual. And once I did, I was really confused because it was already dark outside. I started wondering what had happened to my mother because she never takes her keys with her. I'm the one who opens the door for her when she gets back from work at the end of the day. So I wondered why she wasn't home yet. I was about to grab my phone and call her when I realized some of the lights from our hallway were on. For a second, I thought I was dealing with an intruder or something but I heard my mom's voice right away. How did she get inside? How come I never heard the door? I got up to make sure it was really her, and it was. When I asked her how she had gotten inside, she got really mad at me, asking if I was crazy, and told me that I was the one who had opened the door for her. I asked her how the workday was and went straight back to my room after. I never opened that door. I was sleeping. So who the hell opened it for her? The door was locked from the inside. Yes, I've already considered sleepwalking, but I've never had it, and no one has ever seen me doing it. And I think my mom would have noticed if I was sleepwalking as opposed to just opening the door as usual. To this day, I know that somebody who apparently looked like me opened that door, but I never did.
I was about 15 years old when this happened. It happened in school, which was in Ireland. In my school, we had compulsory subjects that we had to take, such as math, English, etc. We were able to pick two option subjects. I chose technology, kind of like woodworking, but with circuits as well, and art. My best friend of like 12 years and I got put into the same technology class. Now, to be honest, all we ever did in that class was mess around. We never completed our projects, and instead we would just burn stuff and do stupid things. Anyway, each table was square, and one person was sat at each edge, and beside each person, connected to the desk, was a mechanical vice. It's basically something that you could tighten to hold something in place. My friend and I would literally put anything in there and just squish the crap out of it. One day, we had a piece of copper wire. It was quite thick, I'd like to say a centimeter in width, and it was probably like eight or nine centimeters long. We placed it in the vise and started twisting the knob and tightening it on the wire. When the vise fully closed, we opened it to see what would have happened to the wire. However, when we opened it, it was gone, and I mean like fully vanished. We started to look under the table, in the vice, around other tables, even behind our teacher's desk. After looking everywhere, we thought maybe we dropped it and somebody picked it up. We had like eight others in our class, so we just asked them if they had picked up a copper wire. And of course they replied, no, didn't you just squish it? Or no, I didn't see anything. Now I want to emphasize that my friend and I spent at least an hour looking for this wire, and we tested another wire in the vise to see if that would vanish, but instead it just fell on the floor when the vise was opened. We just laughed it off and said that it's probably some kind of interdimensional thing, but we've really been puzzled about what happened ever since. Reading some posts about glitch in the matrix experiences reminded me of an experience my mom had about 10 years ago. I asked her about it again tonight, and she retold it to me to make sure I had all the right details, so I'm telling the story on her behalf. My mom was driving into the city one day and was stuck in traffic. We live in Ireland. She was looking out the window at the buildings and saw an old woman sitting in a wheelchair in the doorway of one of the buildings. She described this woman as a shawley, which apparently was the name of the women in this part of the city in the 1940s and 50s who worked in the marketplace. They were called shawleys because of the black shawls they wore. She remembers the woman looking out onto the road with a solemn expression, and my mom was particularly fascinated by her because it had been so many years since she had seen one of these women. The traffic moved on and she parked in a car park around the corner from the street. About an hour later, she was leaving the city and looked over to the side of the street as she was passing to see if the woman was still there. All of the buildings were run down and boarded up, including the doorway the woman had been standing in. She said that the buildings looked entirely different to how she had seen them just an hour before. My mom has always thought of this as sort of a seeing through the veil type of thing. But could it be a glitch in the matrix after all? I was laying down for a nap. I had my two cats snuggled up with me and my two dogs were outside. All of a sudden, I heard toenails on the hardwood floor, and then sniffing beside the bed. My brain went, okay, one of the dogs is in here. And then I came instantly all the way awake, because my brain went, wait, how did they get in the house? I sat up expecting to see one of the pups sitting beside my bed, but there was nothing. I checked all the rooms, no dogs. The doors were all shut. I looked outside and both dogs were still out there. I have no explanation, 
other than perhaps I was dreaming while I was semi-conscious, or I had a visit from a church grim or black dog. I specifically say church grim because my house is unique. It was originally built attached to a church in the 70s for the pastor's family. My great-grandma bought the house in the 90s from the kids of the original pastor. She attended the church and was extremely devout, so when the pastor passed away, she would go into the church from her house every Sunday and turn the heat on and prepare for service. She lived here until she died. Shortly before she died, the church had a new church built, so the old one became abandoned. My grandma inherited the house, and my husband and I bought it from her. So I'm living in my great-grandma's old house that's attached to an old abandoned church. The church still owns the original building, so I don't have access unless I ask. But this is why I think that perhaps I got a visit from a church grim. This story is pretty short, and I have no idea why it happened. But it was pretty late at night, and I wanted to go to sleep. Just right about when I put my head on the pillow and closed my eyes, I immediately had a vision of a gnome, a really short one. In this vision, he stood behind the transparent curtain that was in front of me, since the big window is right at the foot of where I lay. I could clearly see most of his features since the curtain was transparent. He had a huge smile, and he had closed but smiling eyes, bald head, and no beard. His clothes appeared ragged and to be brown and gray in coloring. Right after I had that vision, which didn't seem like my imagination at all, I sat up and I felt really scared. I didn't feel comfortable sleeping near the window. I just couldn't sleep, even though the gnome wasn't there when I opened my eyes. So I went and slept near my sister. Like I said, I don't really know how to explain it, but it wasn't my imagination. It wasn't like when you have a random thought or image in your head that you can easily dismiss. This was like I was watching something happen through my eyes that were closed. Anyway. I would just like to know if anyone else has experienced anything like this related to gnomes. Over the course of two years, I've had weird dreams about a very specific creature lurking in the attic. It always felt malevolent. Now I don't know if it's an actual thing or my subconscious messing with me, but it deeply unsettled me in ways that my dreams almost never do. As somebody who is always aware that they're dreaming, even dreams where I'm being hunted down don't scare me, but this does. There have been so many dreams about it, but a few stick in my head. The least threatening one was a dream where I'm playing video games in my room. I glance out of my bedroom door, and I see an arm dangling from the open attic. The hand moves like it's beckoning me to come closer. I don't, because, obviously, but I watch it. It never leaves the attic, but it keeps trying to get me to go to it. Another dream, I'm in a house I've never been in. My sister and nieces are in this house with me, and I get the impression that this thing is threatening my family. I'm angry, so I get vocally aggressive. I get my family out of there and go back to confront the thing. I see it for the first time in all the dreams that I've had. It was a woman with light purple skin and dreadlocks. I don't remember how this dream ended, but there were more dreams after, never including my family again just me. The most intense encounter I had was a dream where the attic was right above the bed I was sleeping in. I was lying there, very aware that it was watching me. I figured if I ignored it, it would go away. 
wrong. It slowly pulled the covers off of me. After a few minutes of lying there, cold, trying to decide if it was safe to pull the blanket back up, it grabs me by the throat and lifts me up about a foot off the bed and starts choking me. I felt like my lungs were going to burst when it let go and let me fall back onto the bed, gasping for breath. I don't know how many dreams I've had since this one, but I know it's been at least a year since I dreamt about it. I'm very uneasy around attics now, and I always expect to look up and see it again when I pass underneath one, awake or not. Even right now, I keep throwing glances at the attic door right outside my bedroom. Nothing's there, of course, but it's still on my mind. If this thing is not my subconscious and it's an actual entity, I have no idea what it could be. In my limited experience with the paranormal, I've never encountered anything that felt malevolent before. Just this. My hope is that either my brain just decided it wanted to be terrified of addicts, or that this thing got bored with me and left me forever. This happened when I was around 9 or 10. I was staying the night at my friend Catherine's for the first time. We met the summer before and we'd been inseparable ever since. Cat lived in this old two-story house, surrounded by woods and dirt road. The house itself gave me an uneasy feeling when I first saw it. The shutters were falling off. The paint on the house seemed to be fading. It was an old piece of crap now that I think about it, but at the time, I was excited. I remember walking in after staring at the house for what seemed like 20 minutes. Surprisingly, the inside was a lot nicer than the outside, so I pushed that uneasy feeling down and just shrugged it off as nerves. I remember the smell of the house. I can't pinpoint it, but it was different, like walking into a musty room. I started to walk around, just to explore my surroundings, but I noticed Kat's mom watching me. I simply smiled and waved, but she just stood there, staring at me, wide-eyed. I had never met her before, but why was she staring at me like that? Suddenly, Kat flew around the corner and tackled me. We both fell and started to giggle. I noticed Kat's mom out of the corner of my eye start to turn around and walk off, and she was gone. Fast forward a couple of hours, Kat and I are laying on a beanbag in her room watching Children of the Corn, which, by the way, was one of my favorite movies at the time. I grew up watching horror movies, mostly Stephen King or any movie that my mom was watching at the time. Not her decision, but mine, because I love the feeling that a good horror movie gives you. She felt the same way, and that's why we clicked so much. Anyway, we were sitting here watching this movie, and suddenly the door opposite us slams closed. We both jumped and giggled and brushed it off because, well, we were kids. Until the second time, when it creaked open and slammed again, not seconds after the first time. Now I'm sitting there staring at this door, trying to figure out how in the world it's opening and closing by itself. In the midst of all that, the only other person in this house is Kat's mom, which I figured out earlier in the day was also just a tad creepy. Do you think it's just your mom? I asked, but she just shook her head. Are you sure? I asked again, but this time she said something that gave me the chills and still does. She said, my mom isn't home, it's just me and you, silly. I just stared at her, trying to wrap my head around what she had just said. Who leaves their nine-year-old home alone with a friend in a two-story house? Where's your mom? I asked her. She's at work. I giggled, thinking that she was just trying to trick me. No, she's at work. She only works for a couple of hours, so she leaves me here because she trusts me. At this point, I'm just looking at her, and she noticed this look of worry on my face. What's wrong? 
she asked. I said, if your mom is at work, then who was that lady staring at me earlier? As I said this, we heard what seemed like footsteps at the time, but thinking about it now, it sounded more like shuffling in one spot above us. I'm completely scared at this point. Every hair on my neck is standing on end, and I just want to leave. I start to get up when Kat pulled me back down and asked me if I heard that noise. I nodded. It was silent again, until the footsteps were back, but louder and faster. We both stared up at the ceiling, and she grabbed my hand. This happens every day, she whispered. I looked over at her, and I could see true fear on her face. The footsteps stopped, and she looked at me. Her face flushed white. Is there an attic? I asked. She pointed up toward the ceiling. Well, maybe it's just squirrels or birds, I kept thinking over and over. You ever notice when you're really quiet, that's when you can hear almost everything around you? Imagine if you're sitting in a house with your best friend alone at 10 years old, and you hear the giggle of a three-year-old child. Mind you, she has no siblings. We were completely alone. Kat was just as scared as I was. I remember thinking that I just wanted to get out of this house. I grabbed her and ran out the door. At least we would feel safer and less scared outside the house than we would in it. Want to hear a story? Kat asked, pulling my mind back into reality. I nodded. Well, this house used to be a daycare. There was this lady that would watch the kids, and one day she just locked them all in the attic. And then she hung herself from a rope in the kitchen. They all died because the kids were hungry and thirsty, and no one found them for months afterwards in this house. My heart started to pound, my eyes wide with fear, and I just looked at her. It's true, she said. I've seen them, the little kids, every day, but I've never seen the lady. But you have, earlier. After she told me this, I don't remember much else except running out the door of her room and making it outside. Cat followed, begging me to stay, but I just had to get out. My stomach felt like knots. I felt as though I had walked into a horror movie, and I just wished the day had never happened. Fast forward years later, that was the last day I had ever seen or heard from Kat. I remember her always coming to play outside at my dad's during the day. I remember what she looked like. I never remembered meeting her parents or seeing them out in public. I'm now 27, and I can't seem to find any proof that she exists. All my friends that I was friends with then, I'm still friends with now, even after all these years. But why not her? I think her scary story might have had some flaws, but I still wonder what happened in that house. I've driven by there maybe 15 times, and I still wonder if maybe she was one of the ones that never made it out.